Recording in progress. Good evening, everyone. This is a meeting of the school committee, December 15th. We have a nearly four hour agenda tonight, so let's go ahead and jump right in. First up is administrative business, the consent agenda. Would someone like to move the consent agenda? And because I can't see you, just go ahead and say if you'd like to move it. I move it. It's Nancy. Right. Thank you, Nancy. And if there's a second, please announce your second. I'll second it, Suzanne. Thank you, Suzanne. Nancy, your vote? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Mariah? All right, Mariah says yes. Andy? Uh, yes. Stephen? Valerie? Yes. And I also say yes. And that leads us now to the superintendent's report with Dr. Guillory. Good evening, everyone. So great to see you all here this evening. We're going to do somewhat of a combined superintendent's report because there were some items that we didn't get to last week, and we'll walk through those uh, for us tonight. So we are certainly want to share our community highlights, uh, share some health update information, as well as announce some upcoming celebrations, observances, and then talk a little bit about the school visits, and then certainly focus our attention on our spotlight on excellence. Starting um, Friday, December 2nd, and the Office of Educational Equity, and we're going to hear more from Janae a little bit later, um, started the, extended the SEED uh, program to Brookline parents, guardians, and caregivers. And so Janae was sharing with me earlier today that the group is looking to meet tomorrow, and there's a group of about 25 or so parents that are going to engage in this process SEED equips each person to connect our lives to one another and to society at large by acknowledging systems of power, oppression, and privilege. The seminars are designed to include personal reflection and testimony, as well as listen to others' voices and learn collectively from each other's perspective. And so, again, uh, Janae can share a little bit more about SEED at, a little bit later, but we're excited to have this partnership um, going with our families. We are also uh, pleased to announce that Bob Thomas was named the MassQ Educator of the Month. Um, he's PSB's Digital Learning Specialist, and he was named Educator for the Month of December. Mr. Thomas's contributions to PSB have impacted nearly every student and staff member in the community. He has cultivated and managed most of the digital and online tools we use in our classrooms, such as Seesaw, Canvas, Jamboard, and Learning Ally. In addition, as an, an ETS specialist for the, for the Driscoll School, Mr. Thomas helped pioneer the launch of Google Education Accounts and Chromebooks for students, a model now implemented within the entirety of PSB. Whether it's been his direct support to individuals or his tireless efforts to leverage our use of technology, Mr. Thomas's efforts have moved the needle on every aspect of PSB, PSB's technology vision. We are grateful for his continued expertise, patience, and thoughtfulness within our community. Congratulations, Mr. Thomas. The Medco Directors Association also held their annual conference last Friday, um, or Friday, December 12th. John King uh, was the, the former US uh, Secretary of Education was the keynote speaker this year. He also, I know him through his time as Secretary of Education in New York uh, and have heard him speak a few times. The theme for this year's conference was focusing on strengthening the social, emotional, and academic health of students and staff of color uh, for self-care and trauma-informed practices. And PSB had quite the contingency that attended the conference down in Norwood, including several of our principals, our Medco staff, uh, as well as several teachers. So it was great to see so many of PSB engaged in this professional development as it directly impacts the lives of our children. 
On Saturday, December 10th, the Medco program ho hosted a showcase. And this was again, um, Medco headquarters or Medco Inc held a meet and greet in Dorchester. Prospective families were invited to learn more about various community agencies and participating school districts. We were especially grateful to have Terrence, a fifth grade student at Ruffin Ridley to support our recruiting efforts. And you see the Medco team there, um, as well as uh, Terrence and I taking a selfie there. So it was quite a, an event. It was about a four hour event over at the Boys and Girls Club in Dorchester and um, quite a bit of interest in PSB. So we were grateful for that uh, continued interest and look forward to many applications coming our way. Um, last week or December 8th, I had the opportunity now as a member of the Superintendents Association Executive Committee to um, attend the first uh, meeting that I was able to make um, and this uh, committee, uh, this meeting was um, in partnership with the commissioner's office, and the commissioner was there with several of his team members. Um, we certainly talked about uh, the legislative platform from the Superintendents Association, updates on um, 37 and a half, a new uh, regulation, an amended legislation there, an update on some of the M MSBA uh, funding um, challenges and supports, as well as looking at the future of education and the commissioners talking about a strategic plan for um, the state as well. So many of the topics that we are engaged in in PSB, uh, we'll see that the DESI itself is undertaking as well as uh, the Superintendents Association. And I think when we hear more from Suzanne later about the legislative platform, some of these topics may appear there as well. And um, an update on our BHS Director of Special Education. Um, Lisa, I'm gonna pass the mic over to you, um, but I'll uh, kick it off and say that we um, are in the process of looking for an interim Director of Special Education and uh, applications are, uh, the application is up and open. And uh, we are in the process of reviewing, or the Special Education Department is in the process of reviewing those applications. So Lisa, I'll pass it over to you to talk us through this slide. Thank you, Dr. Ellery. Um, well, first of all, it's been an opportunity for me to get high school every day. Um, I am continually impressed with our specialists and clinicians continuing to provide exemplary services and programming. Um, I have stepped in to provide that regulatory oversight and support, sharing of team meetings where needed, providing on-site consultation on a daily basis, and providing individual review and signing of all proposed IEPs and related paperwork. Um, we are vetting uh, applications for the interim director. The testing closes on December 23rd. Uh, and we are anticipating a start date for January of 23 um, and uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. As far as our community health update, I think it's very important, especially given this time of year and what's happening in our community as well as around the state and nation. Over the past, past few weeks, PSB has seen an increase and upper respiratory illnesses in students and staff and people coming in sick. Regardless of flu or COVID-19, we encourage individuals to stay home if sick and get vac vaccinated and certainly mask wearing. Remember PSB is a mask friendly environment and we encourage those that uh, may be experiencing some symptoms to take extra precautions as such and, and make sure you're masking up. During the Thanksgiving break, all students and staff received two boxes of test kits for use over the holiday season. We recommended that students and staff test on Monday night, January 2nd, after the winter vacation, or any time that an individual is symptomatic. A COVID and flu vaccine clinic uh, is being held on December 20th at the town of Brookline, a town hall from three to six. And we um, currently we are aware, and Trish shared this information with Patricia Laham, 
shared this information with me a little bit earlier today that we are aware of a great one great level in PSB having an increased pattern of three or more cases within a 10 day period. Prior to Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, our numbers were in the mid 20s uh, in terms of cases. And as you can see, we had uh, an uptick the week after, and we're still hovering around the 50 line. Mariah, I see your hand. Thanks, Linus. I just had one question about the COVID tests. Um, if, if any family um, used all of their tests that they got during Thanksgiving, is there an opportunity for them to pick up extras from the nurse's office? Is that Great. possible? Great question. Uh, Trish and I also talked about that as well, and we will make additional test kits available um, in the front offices for families wishing to pick up an extra kit, an additional kit. Thank you. Will that be in your um, weekly, um, your Friday um, message to the community as it, well? It will be there. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, upcoming celebrations and ob uh, observances. Los Posada, uh, Posadas will be Friday, December 16th uh, through Saturday, December 24th. Deriving from the Spanish word for lodging or accommodation, the religious festival is primarily celebrated in Latin American countries, Mexico and Spain. Las uh, Posadas is celebrated in conjunction with Chris the Christmas season focusing on the nativity and the birth of Jesus. Hanukkah uh, is Sunday, December 18th through Monday, December 26th, a category three holiday. The Jewish Fe Festival of Rededication, also called the Festival of Lights, is an eight day celebration that falls each year in December in the Gre uh, Gregorian calendar. Kwanzaa is Monday, December 26th through Sunday, January First, and this again is a category three holiday. Kwanzaa is a seven day celebration honoring African American culture and heritage, in which each of the seven days is dedicated to a specific life principle. And last but not least, our superintendent visits. I've completed uh, a number of school visits where I've had an opportunity to talk with principals, I always begin my conversations uh, with what's top of mind and simply what's what's on their mind, what's, um, what's exciting about the work, what's challenging about the work, um, what, what, what additional resources or supports may be needed there. So I've been visiting, I visited Heath, Lawrence, Runkle, Lincoln and Driscoll today. And certainly you can imagine, um, each building leader has um, something different that they're focusing on. And we certainly had conversations around um, attendance as well as um, recent uh, look, reviewing their data and having database conversations and what's happening in their uh, schools around data. And that's all forms of data, whether it's attendance, whether it's grades, whether it's MCAST, um, behavioral social, emotional, all of those aspects. And so thinking about the additional supports or resources that they may require, or how do we leverage those uh, in a more succinct manner. Upcoming is Ridley, BHS, and Pierce. Mariah, I see your hand again. Yes, sorry to be such a, a pain. Um, on the previous slide, did you include the last date of winter break? That was on the left side. If I'm, Did I catch that on the left side? Betsy, will you go back one for me? Oh yes, the the calendars on the uh, are over there. I didn't say it um, out loud, but the uh, the dates are here for the winter break. Uh, we return on January third, I believe. Yeah, because I think that the dates that are written there, it says January first is Monday, but if I'm reading that right, I can't read it because it's small. But I just want to make sure everyone knows that. Mon that January 2nd is a holiday. Yeah, January 2nd yeah. is a holiday. So that, that's right. School only starts again on Tuesday the 3rd. Yeah, so. that's right. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I think that one is about early dismissal is what, what's showing there, but we'll make sure that that's clear in the community notice. All right. And with that, we are moving towards, I believe, our spotlight on excellence. Um, our spotlight tonight, we will shine on the Florida Ruff and Ridley School. Principal Buller and FRR first grade teacher Nicole Penn 
are with us tonight, along with second grader Niam Gidwani and his mother Sanjali Gidwani. They are here to share some exciting work they've been doing through a program called Design for Change, including details of um, Naham's presentation of this work at a global conference in Malaysia recently. The goals and activities of the Design for Change program are just one important part of the comprehensive work that at the school to ensure a culture of respect, compassion, and kindness. Without further ado, I will pass the mic over to Principal Buller. Thanks so much, Dr. Gillery. I'm going to keep my comments pretty brief so that I can turn it over to Niam and Miss Penn to get started, and then Sanjali will join us. Hey, Sanjali, it's nice to see you. Um, so, I one of the one of my favorite things about being a principal and working in Brookline is that you don't have to go very far um, to access wealth of resources that exist in our community, and we don't have to go outside of the honeycomb of our hive to find amazing resources that exist within the families. Um, of our school community. And so I am really grateful for um, Sanjali and her family and bringing design for change to our school community. And Niam and Miss Penn are going to talk a little bit about some of the work they did last year in first grade. Niam's going to get a chance to talk about how he presented that work in Malaysia at a global conference. And then Sanjali is going to tell us a little bit about how we're taking the design for change process to really look at um, some of the different things that have been happening in our school around social conflict and bullying and how we're going to approach um, creating that culture of kindness and care. So Niam and Ms. Penn, I'm going to turn it over to you. Sure. I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm recovering from the flu, so I sound obviously still sick. Um, but uh, there we go. The design for change slideshow. Nice job. So, Neam, I miss you so much because this was so all of your brain and all of our friends from last year. We, we put all of our brains together and your mom came and your dad came and you, they introduced us to this concept of design for change. And um, Sanjali came in and she wanted me to help sort of pinpoint a problem in the school. And what we did was we used this um, FIDS model, the feel, imagine, do and share model to kind of brainstorm ways that we could make a change with, with something that was a problem in the school. So as a first grade teacher, I quickly identified a problem as the bathroom. It is not only messy, it is unsupervised and can be a little kooky. Uh, maybe Neam can speak more to that. Um, so what we did is we discussed how we feel about the bathrooms being an unsafe and dirty environment and the students shared how they felt about that. Um, we brainstormed with sticky notes and uh, Neam and his classmates came up with such great ideas of how it was rude to the custodians and really unkind to the people who have to clean up after the children. And it's disrespectful when they're making lots of noise and distracting students in the hallway or who are learning. So through that feeling process, we started saying, okay, well, what can we do? So we had to then imagine like, what, what could we do to even implement some sort of change? So Neam, do you want to talk a little bit about what we came up with, what ideas we came up with? Uh, so some ideas were uh, making signs and uh, I did security cameras. Um, I think that's all I remember. Yeah. yeah, so I think so when we were brainstorming the ideas, this is the kind of the creative part of the process. You don't say no to an idea. You say, okay, well, let's build on it. How can we take this idea and make it feasible, make it doable? And Neam in the class, they had such a great idea of, well, why can't we have fake security cameras? We know it's not allowed to record kids in the bathroom, but what if a kid saw a camera? Well, they're not going to fool around and be silly in the bathroom if they thought they were being recorded. So of course, I had my students write persuasive letters to Principal Baller and say, we want to make, you know, uh, signs and use fake security cameras. And we tried to be persuasive. And what happened, Neam? Principal Baller came and what did she say? Uh, what? 
Well, did she say yes to the cameras? Um, she said it. Um, it would be fine, but um, it's kind of illegal to do that because well, because it you know it's like technology, and you don't want to technology in the bathroom. So also true. And Principal Buller wanted us to make sure that students were behaving positive positively with or without being watched by a grown up. We wanted kids to know what to do and follow expectations without maybe feeling like they were gonna get caught. So then we went and said, okay, well now let's think about what we really can do here. We can't do the security camera idea, even though it's a really good idea. We said, okay, well fine, let's, why don't we make two teams? One team is gonna focus on making signs and hanging up signs and very creative slogans around the school. And the other team is going to write a script for a PSA, a public service announcement. And Principal Baller helped us come up with this great idea. And so we came up into these two teams and the kids worked together so hard. And I think what for me as a teacher, I love project-based learning. And I really allow the, the students to be the agents of their own learning, right? Let them kind of run with it. I gave them the tools and the resources. But this project was an opportunity for them to brainstorm and do kind of, and I took a step back and just kind of observed and gave my own feedback and, and kind of guided appropriately. Um, and then Neom, what did we do after we wrote the script? We, wait, we, I did, we put the script and we thought we should put uh, we we should like write it on the um, the signs. A lot of what we had in the script we put on the signs, and then were there people who were actors in the video? Yeah, um, a lot of uh, kids in our class um, were um, acting for the video. Yeah. Do you think we should show everyone the video we made, Neum? Yeah. Okay. I don't hear any uh, volume on this one. Yeah, I, I don't think, yeah, I don't hear it. Yeah, Hello, school. Have you been noticing the problem in the bathroom? Well, we have, and now you're going to see a short video that one piece created on what the problem is how we can fix it. We need to keep our bathroom safe and clean. Snap! Thank <laughs> you. 
problem and one people to really hard to make the script to make the sign and to work. I hope you enjoyed the video. Bye. All right. Um, thank you, Miss Penn, so much for sharing. Um, and and uh, Niam, who is unfortunately at home sick today as well. So, um, so that was a little bit about how um, the design for change process is used. And I might just um, back up just a little bit before we go into um, this adventure we had in Malaysia and tell you a little bit about the design for change program. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me to, to share a little bit about uh, the work that we do as a family, but Design for Change is a global organization that arms students with a feel, imagine, do, share design process to help them create positive positive social impact in their own communities. And the way that we do this is we align ourselves, particularly to social studies, but it really works um, across the entire spectrum, both inside and outside school. And so we have a library of podcasts where we've documented the voices of students from all across the country to talk about different lived issues that they're grappling with. And it could be anywhere from a student who has had to flee from wildfires in California to students experiencing bullying. We've actually even and had the opportunity to highlight voices just from the Brookline community as well. So um, that's how they begin to um, build their feel muscle and build their empathy and then essentially go through a design process called Feel, Imagine, Do, Share, as Ms. Uh, Penn has already uh, outlined for you. But we like to use a design process because we think if you arm students with this kind of thinking from a young age, it really becomes part of their DNA, uh, thinking about how to build empathy in the feel stage, how to imagine, ask really good questions and come up with brainstorming that great con um, divergent, convergent thinking, critically analyzing ideas, and then actually implementing them, which is an opportunity opportunity for students to really um, test out their ideas, prototype them, experience failure, and learn how to fail forward from those ideas, and actually fully implement a project of social change uh, by working as a team. And then reflecting on the great work that they did in the share stage, um, where they begin to actually develop a way to communicate and tell their story of change to really inspire action. So this program is deeply aligned to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but it also is happening across 70 countries around the world. And all students are thinking about ways that they can implement change in their own direct communities. So this is not a program where students do projects of social change and then have it impact students um, in a different country. It's all about serving your own community. And we know that students know this, the problems the best when um, and their own schools and the neighborhoods that they live in, but they also know the solutions to that. So they are our greatest designers, but none of this work is done without partnership with our amazing teachers like Ms. Penn or amazing principals like Ms. Buller or great districts. Um, so my work is really to implement this program uh, across the US and um, I have my little champion here uh, in Niam, uh, who did the Feel Imagine to Share process. Um, with the support of his teacher and his classmates. And then, Niam, where were we just a couple weeks ago? Can you tell us a little bit uh, about the adventure we went on? We went to Malaysia for um, a very special conference. The Design for Change Global yeah. Conference, right? And what happens at this conference, Niam? So all over the world, there are going to be teams that come, and they there's only going to be one team that comes from all the way over other like countries, places, and they come to this conference, and there's only one team, and um, yeah, um, and I get to come because my mom, you know, um, comes, and uh, yeah. Yeah. And what did you do? You got to represent your school and do what at this conference uh, in Malaysia in front of 
500 kids from all over the world. What did you get to do that was special? I got to present. You got to present your project, right? And what do you think people thought of the uh, Rough and Ridley project? Um, I thought they felt really good about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And who who did you get to inspire? Kids from, do you remember the different countries that you got to meet? In um, um, I know Malaysia, India, uh, uh, what else? Spain. Spain. Wait, did, did we have Morocco? Yeah. We had Morocco. Have- yeah, we had students here from all over the world. And here are just a couple of pictures of Niam on stage presenting and meeting friends from all over the world who have also done uh, the same design process. Um, so what did you think, Niam? Did you enjoy that experience? Yeah, I had a really good experience about this very cool Design for Change conference in Malaysia. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Um, and and just to, to to wrap up and share a little bit about the work that um, we're hoping to do at Rough and Ridley, both as a family, but in um, partnership with some of the great communities and initiatives that are um, being spearheaded at the school. Um, we are going to be using actually the same design process, feel, imagine, do, share at uh, a night for um, parents or caregivers where they can come in and help us begin to brainstorm different ways that we might be able to address some of the um, challenges around bullying in the school, which take on so many different forms and shapes and sizes. But we know parents are all deeply concerned about this particular topic. And so we're coming together as um, educators and parents, and we'll be walking parents through a night of feel, imagine, do, share, so they can help identify ways that they can best support their own kiddos and all the other kiddos in the school. Uh, So that's going to be happening next month. And we'll be working actually hand in hand with middle schoolers to help us identify what are those kind of deep seated issues that they themselves are experiencing. So we can start by building empathy for them. Um, I'm also part of the equity pack at school where we host uh, Wednesday night read alouds that some of the other uh, schools uh, are, are partnering with us on. So we're really excited to bring together different topics and issues um, and highlight them every single week with various different guests and student readers. Um, and we're partnering with the access, the um, equity and access team at Rough and Ridley to potentially bring more of design for change programming uh, in alignment with some of the social justice curriculum work that they're doing, at especially the younger grade band. So um, having their social studies move into more student-led action so more and more students can experience this. Um, and we continue to highlight the voices of our Brookline students. We want students all around the world to hear from our students, just as Neam got to present, there are opportunities and more so by way of um, podcasting and sharing their projects um, with our extended global community, because we know that they can drive huge inspiration around the world. Um, so thank you so much for inviting uh, Neam and I and Ms. Penn to present and share a little bit about the work that we're doing um, at Ruff and Ridley. Thank you. We're happy to take any questions if you have any. Questions or comments from school committee members? Yes. Go ahead, Nancy. I I can't not comment. That was amazing. (laughs) This is this is the absolute epitome of innovation. Neam, I have seen many in my career, so many people present. Many, 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 many people present. People came across as nervous. People were uh, and presented very important things. And you are one of the best presenters I have ever, ever, ever seen. I think that what you're doing is really important work. And I really hope you keep going because you're doing a marvelous job. And I'm very, very proud of you. And I'm proud of your entire team. And well done all of you, this was amazing. Just uh, whatever we can do to support you to keep going, please let us know, okay? Well done, congratulations. Thank you so much. Mariah? 
Thanks. I just wanted to say um, what a great job you did presenting, Neem. I can't imagine that when I was your age, I would be as composed and well-spoken as you are in front of this audience, as well as at the conference, Shirley. And I just wanted to mention that Sanjali was one of the members of panel two and very helpful in supporting PSB um, as we considered issues of socio-emotional um, um, wellness and learning during the um, peak of the pandemic. And I just want to say thank you, Sanjali. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. And thank you so much for the opportunity to continue to partner in this work. Suzanne? Yes, thank you. I just want to say again, thank you. Uh, it was great. And Niam, I just am curious, how has it gone? Was this last year's project? And did you see a difference in the bathrooms? Uh, yeah, we saw a lot of difference. Is um, I think I'm still seeing them. You're still seeing the differences? And do you still have signs up or is that project done? Uh, I don't think I see them. Okay, so they learned it and they know already. Yeah. Yeah, and we were able to send out the whole video again to the whole school at the very beginning of the year to help people remember what all the expectations were. Um, yeah. for. So it's a, a good piece that we can now send out yearly to remind people what the expectations are in our yeah. share. And then and you have new students too that come. So now they need to learn that as well. So thank you so much. And thank you to the whole team at the Ridley School. Thank Jennifer? You. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you all for coming and for engaging in this work. It's really exciting to see students as agents of change in the world around them and being able to identify and find action steps. And so it's just lovely and so well spoken. Thank you for coming and presenting. And um, I love the idea of you know bringing, bringing, reminding folks um, the best way to, to operate in the spaces around them and keep them safe and clean. And and hope that you can share that again this year and remind friends of the best way to, to make a safe space at school. So it's just lovely to, to see young people engaging in this. So thank you all for making it happen. Oh, thank you, thank you all so much. And you know, this, this process is very, very close to our family's heart. Um, but I think one thing that is worth mentioning is that this process is being used by kindergartners and all the way up to college students. And, on, and, and it works really, really well with adults. So the design process, I mean, anyone can do, anyone's a designer of change. So, uh, you know, we, we, we look forward to, to doing some more work um, together with you all. Thank you very much, Niam, for that presentation. It was really outstanding. And as others have said, quite impressive. And you're really inspiring a lot of your peers as well. So thank you very much for coming and for sharing your project with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Penn. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. Thank you. And with that, we present the Public Schools of Brookline Spotlight on Excellence is awarded to Niam Gidwani, Sanjali Gidwani, and Ms. Nicole Penn for spearheading the introduction of the Design for Change program at the Florida Ruffin Ridley School as one important step toward ensuring a safe, supportive school culture to benefit all members of the FRR community. With that, here's the Yeah, look at that. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gilroy. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilroy. Great. Yay. <laughs> All right, Niam. Well, if you and your mom want to stay, you're more than welcome to. I imagine you might not want to do that, but thank you again very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. Good night. Any questions or comments regarding any other aspect of the superintendent's report before we move on? No, but I think that's going to carry me through the entire rest of the year. The feel good on that whole thing was, I'm good for the rest of the year. <laughs> Thank you Excellent. for that. All right. So next up, we have a rather sad portion of tonight's school committee meeting, which is a farewell and thank you to Deputy Superintendent for Teaching and Learning, Ms. Leslie Ryan Miller, who, as I believe most in the community are now aware, uh, is going to be leaving us soon uh, to return to Boston. And we have uh, some people who would like to offer a farewell. And first, I'll turn to Ms. Jamie Yadoff.
Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Um, first, I'd like to thank everybody for allowing me to speak tonight about my dear friend, Leslie Ryan Miller. Leslie has spent the last seven years building positive, meaningful relationships with people as a part of her everyday practice. She has the ability to make people feel heard and understood, even in the most heated situations, and can move someone from frustration to positive action with apparent ease. Leslie has a deep and inspiring love for the students that she serves. Peer students still light up when Leslie walks through the door. They feel and appreciate her deep love and care for them. In every discussion, in every decision, what is best for students is at the forefront of Leslie's thinking. With Leslie facilitating a discussion, conflicts are avoided. People are able to engage with each other positively and find common ground because she holds everyone to a high standard of civility. Leslie asks meaningful and important questions that keep the focus on student learning. Her tireless emphasis on student achievement has helped move many conversations in Brookline forward in new and critical ways. Leslie has helped community members see that lack of progress is not a failure, it's a call to try something new. And most importantly, Leslie is a friend. She has listened when I cried, laughed with me until it hurt, and given me exactly the advice I needed to hear, even if I really didn't want to hear it. I have been lucky to learn from many incredible educators in my 23 years working in public schools, but none have shaped the way I think about school leadership the way my work with Leslie has. Leslie, I am deeply grateful for all that you have done for Pierce and for the public schools of Brookline. And I will miss you more than my words tonight can express. Thank you for all that you have done for the staff and students in Brookline. Boston is incredibly lucky to have you joining their team. Thank you, Jamie. See, Jamie's trying to make me cry on this recorded session and I'm trying really hard. I have my tissue. Jamie, thank you so much. You know, I think the world of you and um, thank you so much. Next up, we have Mr. Gabe McCormick, who'd like to deliver some remarks. Hi, everyone. Um, so I had the pleasure of welcoming Leslie um, on her first day in Brookline um, in 2016. Um, I get the honor of having Leslie's first Cuddy's lunch, I believe, um, which I know is an important part of her life and will bring her back to Brookline from time to time. Um, but really, um, Jamie said a lot of what I was is in my head, right? Um, everything there about how Leslie treats everyone with dignity and respect, um, how being good to people is always the first step and that includes students and that includes adults, it includes families. Um, as, a, as an administrator and a district administrator, I've learned a ton from Leslie about how to treat people and how to treat people that you disagree with or treat people who aren't necessarily giving you respect in the moment, right? That you can maintain that sense of respect for who they are and what they need. And you can find empathy um, for what they're looking for and the perspective they're coming from. Um, I said this a little bit earlier, we had a, a staff celebration for Leslie. And um, when people ask me about whether I like my job, I talk about my boss. And having Leslie as my boss is a big part of that. And one of the things that she does really well is she gives people praise in public she shares widely the successes you do. She gives you credit for what you've done and makes sure people know that you've put in the work. And when she has to check you, she does it in private, right? And she, Leslie has definitely had to check me and we have disagreed about things. And I felt that respect during that process as well. And so it's been, it's been a joy, it's been a pleasure and I wish you well. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you so much. And Hope you know the feeling is mutual, of course. Thank you. Anyone else? Jennifer? <clears throat> um, I knew this would be hard. Um, okay. So uh, it's been a real pleasure to work with Leslie Ryan Miller. I first met Leslie in her role as principal at the Pierce School. 
attended a school site council meeting at Pierce and I was so impressed with her leadership and the way that the team worked together with really clear goals and a, a passion for what's doing that what's best for kids. Um, but most of my experience working with Leslie has been in her role as deputy superintendent of teaching and learning and her work in the office of teaching and learning has been incredibly valuable to the public schools of Brookline and our children our families our staff and in fact, I find it hard to put into words how I felt about working with Leslie. It's, it's truly been a joy to work with her, especially in my role as chair of the curriculum subcommittee. Leslie's a great listener. She sees the big picture. She understands the work that needs to be done to achieve goals. She's personable. She's professional. She's a leader who truly wants to collaborate. She's flexible while maintaining goals and expectations for excellent teaching and learning. She's a leader who wants what's best for our children, our faculty and our families. She really understands the technical and adaptive challenges that we need to tackle in our district. And working with Leslie has brought me great joy and inspiration. And I truly hope that our futures intertwine. Um, working with you, Leslie has been wonderful and I am really sad that you are leaving and I, I wish you all the best. Uh, thank you, Jen. I'm so thankful for your partnership with the curriculum subcommittee, and I think we've been able to move a lot of work together, um, so we will stay in touch. This is not goodbye. Jenae? Thank you. Um, gosh, I feel similarly. It's hard to, to talk about you, Leslie. Um, Gabe mentioned meeting you on the first day. You and I started in as administrators in 2016 together. So I kind of think of you as my sister. We're the same age, I found out, even though you know you thought that you were older and Harold had to correct you. I always know how old I am, just saying. Um, so the best I could do to kind of come up with some words for you was to use your name as an acrostic. So here we go. For L, I said luminous. I think everyone can agree when you walk into a room, you shine bright. I'll never forget starting on the fifth floor last year and I'd be in my office working away and I'd hear, good morning, everybody. Um, and you have this way of coming in, brightening up the space. I was like, I should be better at saying good morning <laughs> to people. You really are so luminous. Thank you for your light. Um, e, I had essential. We all know this in any conversation, academic, social, whatever that it may be, you are an essential voice. You're an essential person to conversations about kids, with parents, with colleagues. So thank you for that. For S, I had special. There are so many S words that are great that I could use about you, but there's just something special about you. You are going to be so missed. There's something about your impact in this district, in this community. You're just incredibly special. Um, then I had legendary. Um, as Jamie mentioned, I we were at Pierce Partners last week and I, I tend to get a reaction when I walk into a room just, you know, just because there's something about those kiddos when they see you, it's the wild love, the yelling, the, the running to you, you are legendary at Pierce um, and throughout the district for sure. So thank you for that. For E, the last E, I had easy going and edifying. There's something easy about your way. You're not a person who people are like, oh, I can't talk to her. You're so approachable, easy to talk to. So thank you for that. And then why was a little bit harder. I said, yes, everything is yes with you. And then there's um, Yoko Zuna. I don't know if you know what that is. It's uh, the grand champion of sumo wrestling. So you're not a sumo wrestler, but I don't think, but when it comes to gargantuan issues and challenges and problems, you have a way of making us get to the end and we are champions thanks to you and what you're able to accomplish. So you will be so missed. I'm glad you're going to come back because um, we are going to miss you around here. Thank you. Thank you, Janae. I do feel like it's full circle with us and we did come into this together. So thank you so much, Janae. Mariah. Thanks, David. So um, Leslie came to Pierce when we, Piper Smith Mumford retired and then we had a principal for a year who left very suddenly in August. And we were looking for an interim. And um, and Leslie came from central office to be the Pierce principal. So the first time I met Leslie was, I want to say, like mid-August, maybe two weeks before school started, maybe a week before school started. And I was incredibly nervous. I was a Pierce parent, longtime Pierce parent. 
And I thought, who is this person? I didn't know you. And, and <laughs> from that very first meeting, I think I, I, I was just in love with who you are as an educator leader, as someone who can tell people the truth and do it in a way that as, as um, Gabe said earlier, respects them while also being honest and um, makes them feel heard, um, even when you don't always agree with them. And I've just been so um, thrilled to have you um, with us and to be able to work with you before when I was on the Pierce PTO and now as a member of school committee. And I think about a year and a half ago or so, or two years ago, whenever it was that you made the jump back from Pierce into the deputy superintendent role, I remember feeling um, so, I, I think I even said it at school committee, you know, I was I was happy for the district and sad for Pierce. And, and now I'm gonna say I'm happy for Boston that they're gaining such an amazing person again, but sad for Brookline. But I wish you nothing but the best, Leslie. You are just one of my favorite people. And um, and this is a sad moment, but I'm also very thrilled for you. And I can't wait to hear about um, the next great things that you're going to be doing. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariah. I'm so thankful for your support throughout the years. Thank you. Suzanne? Yeah, thank you, David. Well, Leslie, now we go back a few years. Um, <laughs> I knew Leslie in Boston and she was superior then. And I've seen you go through many jobs actually over the last maybe 10 years and you have excelled in every single one of them. And you continue to grow and you continue to bring us along with you. So I know that you will do fine things in Boston. Um, but I know it'll be challenging, but you know those challenges already, and I know that you're ready for them as well. Uh, but even today, as you were leaving us, you spoke about the experiences of Brookline of learning about what an excellent school district can look like. And I just, as to your credit, that you can come in and learn and teach us and take us along. I will say a special thank you uh, for moving the Office of Teaching and Learning forward. I think we were a little stuck and you kind of unstuck us and gave us some directions and forward movement. And you've started many initiatives and you know, Gabe and Michelle and the rest of us, it's up to us to make sure that they continue uh, so that, and we will give you credit, Leslie, we will give you credit for all that good hard work. <laughs> So thank you so very much. You know, we're just 1.8 miles away from the bowling building. So of course you can come back anytime. And, uh, but I wish you the very best. Thank you so much, Leslie. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you so much. Michelle? Yeah, so, whoops, I'll make this quick. Um, so a lot of people have already said this, but people, when they're leaving, people always find nice things to say about the person. But I think with Leslie, it's very true. And it's probably more true than even with most. Um, she's creative and thoughtful and patient, and humble and honest. And the students of Boston are getting a very rare gem that's hard to find. Um, a true leader leaves things in a place where the work can continue. And Leslie's provided that to OTL and to the Pierce School. Uh, she's a boss, but which I've loved personally, but even better, she's become our friend and also my lunch buddy. Um, and we wish you really well in Boston and we know you're gonna do great things there. Thank you, Michelle. We'll still have to get some lunches in. <laughs> Andy? Um, hi, Leslie. Um, so like Mariah, right, I, my family knew you first as our principal at Pierce uh, for three years, and I remember you in that role kind of spreading calmness and confidence and to giving all the families the sense that, um, you know, whatever came up, it would be handled with uh, good sense and humor and compassion. Um, I would say that from your time as deputy superintendent, I'm most grateful for the work that you've been doing to strengthen the collaboration between general ed and special ed, and um, how you've always treated special ed as being very much your business uh, and not something that just sits within the, the Office of Student Services. Um, so for that, I'm, I'm really grateful. And so thank you. And I hope you'll be supported in Boston to do great things there as well. Thank you, Andy. I so appreciate it. Nancy? Until Jack, I said hi. <laughs> Leslie, I didn't have as much time as everybody else to work with you. 
but in the, in the time that I had, I, I think every, every, I wish you every good thing for every good thing you've done for us. And so that's a lot. <laughs> um, thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for caring so much about, Brooke. I'm crying. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you so much for caring so much about Brookline. And I just wish you so, 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 so well in everything that you do, you and your whole family. And we are always here and there'll always be a chocolate chip cookie waiting for you. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Nancy. I was about to say thank you for feeding me, <laughs> for feeding me and for all the support. And um, if I may, you know, I won't take long, but I just want to say huge thanks to everyone. Um, everyone on this call has really impacted me in some way, some positive way. Um, and, you know, I've said this before um, many times, but um, really the impetus for my leave is um, you know, I live in, in Dorchester, um, you know, we are a part of many um, facets of the Dorchester and Roxbury communities, um, and this really was the opportunity opportunity for me to serve the community where I live um, and serve the children of Boston. Um, and that being said, it's really bittersweet because I'm going to miss Brookline. Um, I learned a lot it, during my time in Brookline. Um, I'm really thankful for the experience and the experiences came right on time. I had been in Boston public schools for about 20 years um, and I needed to see something different. Um, and Brookline gave me that and really showed me um, what all of the resources um, that, that we should afford um, students and the type of student experiences that we want all of our students to have. Um, and I'm really gonna take that knowledge with me to Boston. And so I'm just really thankful again for everyone on this call, special shout out to the Pierce community, huge shout out to the OTL team, um, Gabe and Michelle. Um, we've really been the three musketeers and we're doing this work together. Um, Janae, my sister on the floor, um, it's just been, um, it's been amazing. And I know that the district will continue to thrive under Dr. Guillory's leadership. He's the right leader for Brookline. Um, and it was hard to leave under his leadership. But I also know that um, things will continue to grow and, and, and prosper um, under his leadership. And so again, just really thankful for the work that we've been able to accomplish, even in the short time in OTL. I'm really proud that we've got the M class screener rolled out. You'll hear tonight about CST. Um, and RTI and that review just got completed. So I'm looking forward to sharing that information with um, folks. We've got the reimagining ninth grade work um, off the ground, the middle school review. I will definitely um, be watching that school committee um, when you all hear the results of that. I think that you're gonna be really just floored at um, what you're gonna be able to learn about middle school and the opportunities for growth and the successes there. Um, New Solutions is doing an incredible job. So just really thankful for the opportunity to work here, to grow here, to learn here um, and thankful for all of you. And so this is, this is not goodbye. I still have my mentee through the Pierce Partners Program and I promised her we will be having lunch every week. Um, so you guys think that you're getting rid of me, but you're not, I will be around. So thank you all very much. I I appreciate the kind words. You're very welcome, Leslie. They're quite deserved. What I was going to say is somewhat similar in tenor to Michelle's remarks. I receive a lot of emails about various people. Most of it's quite negative, but when it came to you, it was overwhelmingly consistently positive. Whenever there would be a job opening for virtually anything in the school district, I would receive a bevy of emails saying, you really have to make sure that Leslie gets interviewed for this because she's terrific. <laughs> and so you really stood out in, in that sense. Your reputation precedes you. Thank you so much, David. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. And very thankful for your leadership in this role. I know it is not easy um, to be the chair of the school committee um, in Brookline on top of that. So I'm um, thankful for your leadership. And yeah. Leslie, I'll just say it again, it's, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve alongside of you leading this great organization. Uh, I'll say it again for, since we're recording, it's not too late to change your mind. <laughs> 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 the, door, the door is open for you. But uh, again, it, it's been an honor and a privilege to, to serve alongside of you. Many of you may not know, I have uh, check-ins, one-on-one check-ins with the senior team. And Leslie always has a way of coming in and says, oh, Dr. G, I don't have that much on, on my agenda. And an hour later, we're wrapping up. 
<laughs> in the conversation, we, we're talking about the work, we're talking about students and learning, and then about what the organization needs. So it's always been great conversation about how we dig deeper and move the, move the work of the organization forward. So thank you again for your partnership in this work. Thank you, Dr. G. All right, so uh, Mariah. Thanks, David. I just have a question because I actually don't know this. This isn't. Uh, this is just about um, uh, Dr. Guillory. Whether the um, an interim has been identified or what the plan is for leadership of the office. Not yet, but I will be communicating that shortly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, thank you again, Leslie, for all the contributions you've brought to Brookline. And we hope that we will still get to collaborate with you in some way moving forward. So that brings us to public comment. We have a couple of speakers signed up. First will be Ms. Faith Dantowitz. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Were you introducing me, Faith? Yes, go right ahead. Apologies. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of CPAC Executive. My name is Faith Dantowitz. I'm the mother of a college student, a student at BHS, and a student who is currently out of district. I am also currently the CPAC Secretary, the CPAC High School Liaison, and the only member of CPAC Executive available to speak tonight. I'm also a person that many special educators, administrators, and many students and families feel safe speaking with. I'm speaking today because CPAC is concerned about the current situation at Brookline High School. The hiring team for the Director of Special Education at Brookline High School, of which I was a part, recommended Ida Ramos for the director position. We knew the, that Brookline High needed a strong special education leader willing to go up to bat for her students and her team, particularly someone with an eye to disproportionality. Dr. Ramos actually wrote her doctoral dissertation on disproportionality but we felt Dr. Ramos was the ideal candidate. Did we think she might ruffle feathers? I certainly hoped she would. Last year, the egregious issues that CPAC raised alarm bells about at BHS included all of the following. General educators refusing to attend IP meetings, a huge non-compliance issue with ADA regarding the elevator, general educators not responding to special educators and team facilitator emails, General educators unwilling to include children with special needs in their classes, the repeat and abject refusal to admit students into honors and advanced level courses because they could not be supported. General educators having not read IEPs and more. Nearly all of these issues are directly against the mandates set forth by DESE and the protected rights of students under IDEA. This harms our students. It does harm to our students. According to IDEA, students are entitled to a fair and appropriate public education in their least restrictive environment. They also should be taught in a level that is appropriate to their intellectual abilities and will allow them to accomplish the goals set out in their IEPs. Why am I sharing this with you right now? Because this has not been happening at Brookline High and Ida was supporting both our students and families to ensure this was actually taking place. That is tremendous. In five short months, Ida was tearing down walls that had been built up by administration at the high school over years. Special education families were not told for weeks about Ida's departure. This is completely unacceptable. Over Thanksgiving, CPAC was made aware of the unceremoniously sudden departure of Dr. Ramos. We requested a meeting with the Assistant Superintendent of Office of Student Services on November 29th. We do finally have a meeting with her this Friday, which has had been postponed. We wrote voicing our very real concern that the administration's email suggested pe suggesting people reach out to an excellent PSB employee, but an individual who is in no way an educational administrator was unacceptable for families and educators. We wrote to the superintendent sharing our concern regarding this leave to which we received no response. And we finally wrote again with a CC to the school committee chair. We still did not hear from the administration. We then wrote next to the entire school committee and then we finally received a response and a meeting was arranged and rearranged. Our CPAC feels very fortunate because we've always had an excellent relationship with all administration. 
We've always felt heard. We've never felt ignored. We've often felt respectfully disagreed, but we still felt fortunate to engage. CPAC executive always wants to ensure that special educators' voices and student voices are heard. We wanna understand how we may suddenly be losing another woman of color in leadership. That would be two within weeks. We are so sad to see Leslie Ryan Miller departing as well. And we had information that might've helped make the decision more fair and more equitable. Sadly, special educators, team facilitators, students, CPAC and families were not allowed that opportunity. Dr. Romas had in five months stood up for nearly 24% of the students at BHS and their special educators. How can we ensure the replacement for Dr. Ramos is a strong leader who will be given the opportunity to succeed and set up to succeed regardless of the color of his or her skin or any preconceived notions and in particular, any unconscious bias? How can we hope to even have the opportunity to hire quality special education administrators with this disconcerting history. Our points are many, and this is a lot of word salad, so allow me a moment of salience. Why was Dr. Ramos fired for, without hearing from students, special educators, team facilitators, and all the players that ensured Ida was doing her work and improving special education at BHS, morale, and engagement? What can the school committee do to present, prevent the inability of PSEB to keep strong women of color in leadership positions? And how can we ensure that these women depart, when these women depart, we know what we can do better to retain their important community leadership? How can we ensure that the administration is listening to special educators and to their CPAC to ensure, to ensure they truly have a full picture of all the goings on? How can we Im improve special education if general education administration leadership will not listen. Special educators are currently in high demand. We are now justifiably fearful that we will lose our greatest asset, our special educators, our special education administrators, and our team facilitators. I cannot imagine a community left feeling more unimportant, undervalued, and more unheard that th than this has made them feel. How can leadership set up new administration of color and special educators of color to be successful while respecting their cultural differences and while meaningfully embracing the diversity they bring to the table? How can we ensure in future that families are notified immediately when a director of special education suddenly departs? It is unacceptable to me that Mr. Meyer, the head of the high school has repeatedly refused to meet with special educators, most recently prioritizing the English department despite the fact that special educators just lost their program director and have nobody present for them daily at Brooklyn High School. How is that acceptable performance? How can general educators work collaboratively, collaboratively I'm sorry, with special educators when general administration does not set the same expectation and example? This is in fact a significant finding in the special education report completed in, 2000, in 2022. It is further disheartening that the superintendent of schools has not met with special educators to engage them and discuss the impact of this on special educators and special education, particularly when special educators are as a community of seasoned educators in high demand. Please take a moment and think about the impact this all must have on our most vulnerable students, on our students on IEPs and our students in specialized programs. That is approximately 24% of the student body at Brookline High School right now. Our special educators are the lifeline for so many of our most vulnerable students. We must do better. If you will allow me to continue, I'm sure I'm over the collective time of Victoria, Linda, and myself. I wanna leave you with the words that have been shared with me confidentially for se from several anonymous special educators. Ida immediately understood the nature of my student and program's needs. Ida got to know all of us, stopped by our programs regularly, offered incredible support and guidance, and renewed for me my commitment to remain at BHS. This changed drastically in late November when Ida was all of the sudden gone with no warning, explanation, or communication. I experienced Ida as an incredible, honest, straightforward, transparent, knowledgeable, student-centered, and passionate leader. It feels like the special education of community of BHS students, families, and staff has faced hit after hit after hit. 
We had a strong and passionate director who was, mo was committed to staying long-term. I started this year feeling hopeful and then happy in my job for the first time since COVID hit. I had finally been able to balance my workload and have felt stability and support. Having Ida in place was a key element in this. Working between buildings, I saw her often in both locations and collaborated with her on student cases. After a strong start to the year, this hopeful and happy sentiment has been shattered. I feel demoralized all over again. The sudden removal of leadership with no explanation, the hypocritical racist undertones, and the total and complete disregard for the special education department that we aren't important enough for communication. That is where I am now, feeling completely and totally disrespected at work. Thank you for listening to CPAC and to the voices of special educators. It is important that our families, our students, and our educators feel heard and work together to ensure our school community feels equitable to all. We must do better. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Ms. Carolyn Fall. Hello, um, Carolyn Thal. I am a parent in the school system. Um, I have three different things I'd love to just put out there. Um, number one, in your upcoming conversation this evening about recruitment of staff in underrepresented um, populations, um, I hope you will please consider including in your thinking male and male identifying teachers, unit A teachers. Um, I'm lucky enough to be a parent to children of, of both genders. Um, I've been in the school district for 12 years. And my observation is that the absence of male role models um, in the K through eight grades is unfortunate at best. Um, and, it, at, and at worst can actually result, I think, um, my son is happy in school, but can result in um, long-term impacts on boys' experience of school and their attitude about school. And I think that there's um, a, a lot of national data right now that's showing um, boys and men trending away from secondary higher education. Um, so that's a longer conversation, but I hope you understand what I mean. And I just wanted to put in a plug for male teachers. Um, Sorry, I, I, I'm going to have to say that I was, um, I'd say mortified <laughs> watching earlier this week, um, the building commission meeting, where I saw approval of a change order for flooring at the Driscoll School for $517,000. Um, I went to architecture school, I worked in the building trades for many years. Uh, I know what terrazzo is, it is a durable material, so are lots of other materials. Uh, terrazzo is a luxury material. Um, so I, I felt that I witnessed um, a rather flippant attitude towards taxpayer money in the conversation. Um, there's a lot of discussion among this group about inclusion. Brookline cannot be inclusive if only wealthy people can live here. Um, so I, I just had to say that. Um, and then really the substance I... Um, I have a question that I've been trying to get answered. I know we don't dialogue in this format, um, but I've written four times um, to policy subcommittee members and district leadership with two questions about PSB's bullying prevention policy. Um, I first wrote on November 25th and last on December 2nd. Um, and unfortunately I haven't heard back. So I figured I would just try this avenue. My questions, are, I would like to understand how the PSB bullying policy was um, established and developed and is implemented in the context of privacy protections provided under FERPA, specifically in the investigation section of the bullying policy. And I also would love to know what training PSB requires and provides on the bullying policy for building level administrators. Um, so I regret that 
Um, so far, those questions haven't been answered. I know everybody's busy. We're all busy. Um, I think the second question is pretty simple. I understand the first one may be more nuanced, um, but I would imagine that in the years of developing the bullying policy and in current um, policy conversations that privacy protections must have been discussed. Um, so if my question wasn't clear, um, I would be happy to clarify it if somebody would be willing to dialogue um, in reply to me. So thank you. All right, <clears throat> and that concludes public comment. Next up, we have presentations and discussions of current issues, diversity recruiting and retention efforts. Ms. Utaro. Thank you. Okay. Um... I think we're gonna get a slide deck. Am I sharing the slide deck or? Sorry, I'm not sure. Um, if you have it, Janae. Uh, I do, should I, can, sh should I just share screen? You can do that from your- Okay, okay. Um, one second. Great. Well, thanks everyone, good to see you all again. Um, I am just gonna get started. We're actually going to, uh, we'll cut to the agenda section and then I'm gonna get into some of the work that um, we in the Public Schools of Brookline have been doing. This is a number of educators and obviously the Office of Equity uh, in connection with human resources and so many other um, departments in our district. Uh, we're gonna jump down to the second large bullet here with diversity retention and recruitment efforts. So I'm going to skip now um, just to this, this um, slide, just to give you all some information on what our staffing data looks like currently by race, ethnicity, and gender. And all of this can be found um, at the DESE website. And as you can see, our numbers for 2022-23, the breakdown by race is here um, at the top. I wanted to mention too that last year when Ty and I shared this presentation, um, our numbers were different. So African-American staff, the number was 101 last year. So we've definitely climbed up a bit. Let me just double check that I've got the right numbers there. Um, and in addition, for example, I won't go through everything, um, but our, our numbers for uh, staff members who identify as Asian was 72.8. So you see that our numbers are um, inching up ever so slightly. These numbers, and I know um, there have been a couple of questions about this. I should say that the numbers that you're looking at do not include um, custodial staff or per diem substitutes. The numbers also don't include coaches. It does, these numbers do, however, include long-term subs or um, nursing subs. They're also, they are included as part of this data as our part-time staff. Um, and so that gives you a sense of the numbers. Just looking down a little bit lower, Carolyn was just speaking about um, our numbers of male identifying teachers or, or educators in the district. And certainly this is something that we've been training an eye on as well, particularly in the K to eights and the pre-K to eights um, that our numbers of, of male identifying uh, educators are low and we're definitely training an eye on that. One other thing that I wanted to say about this slide is that if you add up the percentages of uh, BIPOC staff or staff of color, those numbers amount to about 18.8%. And then you'll notice that our white staff are at 81.2%. And so I bring up this number as we go to the next slide. Um, let's see if I can move the slide. Um, because we did something similar last year when we shared this presentation. If you take a look at our student enrollment data, um, you could just take a look there and see what our numbers are looking like. You'll notice that in terms of percentages, 49.9, so 50% of our student population identifies as white. And then um, again, sort of adding up the percentages, some simple math here, in terms of the district, um, you will see that 50% of our students of 50 percent of our students are students of color or BIPOC students. So we're half and half, um, 49.9 white students, 50 
percent uh, students of color. And then again, kind of just comparing these numbers, and this is something that we're doing a lot of thinking about, is obviously we've got 81.2% of staff who are white um, as compared to 18.8% of staff who are BIPOC. So we're doing a lot of thinking about those numbers as we move forward and thinking about recruiting and retention. So I'm gonna keep moving along and definitely take some questions at the end. Um, the slide that I'm sharing with you right now um, is a slide that uh, Dr. Guillory mentioned the MDA conference or the METCO director conference, which was at the very beginning of December. Um, and Dr. Saren Daly is a person who presented to us as well. Um, and I'm gonna also talk about the Massachusetts Partnership for Diversity in Education, um, which is a group that um, Brookline Public Schools of Brookline has been a part of for a long time. Dr. Saren Daly is also going to be presenting to the MPDE group later, um, well, I shouldn't say later this year, the top of um, 2023, she just completed a dissertation um, and we found that her findings in her dissertation, which were really all about what educators of color um, tend to suggest um, or they report to be supportive um, in terms of in their retention and, um, and their contentment in the districts that they're in. Um, this is in ways in which their critical consciousness is sort of increased, that kind of thing. And so she identified, so EOCs is educators of color. So she identified these four things, and I can go more into what her study looks like if anyone's interested. Um, she actually worked with a district very similar to Brookline. But the four pieces that she mentioned, um, we had already started to engage upon, and I wanted to share this with you all as we move into the, the future slides, but she talks about um, the fact that educators of color reported that affinity groups as healing spaces are going to be super important to their retention, leaders needing to be upstanders, professional development. We'll talk a lot about um, what the uh, Office of Equity is doing around PD in terms of intent and impact and then representation and how much that matters. So to keep it going, the first thing that we wanted to show you in terms of um, our district working around belonging culture is um, the Office of Equity, and many of you have met the amazing Hei Young Ko, who is the Assistant Director of, the, um, of Educational Equity. Uh, she and I and a number of other amazing educators in the district have been working really hard to get some affinity groups going for the adults. We heard not too long ago about student affinity groups um, at the Heath School. Now we're working on district-wide affinity groups for educators. So you can take a look at um, what these are already looking like. Not only do we have affinity groups for our AAPI educators and our LGBTQ plus staff, our BIPOC educators, but we also have um, an anti-racist affinity group for our white staff members. I'm happy to tell you more about some of those in a little bit. Continuing on, so we've got um, retention is so important to us. We like to start with retention more than even with the recruiting. Dr. Saren Daly's um, research does, goes into a lot of that as well. So the affinity spaces is one thing. The other piece with that is we're doing a lot of education around what that means in our district, what that looks like, um, how it's not separatist or you know increasing anything like segregation, but how critical it is to have um, in this case, educators of color come together to talk about non-belonging, to get themselves more to a sense of the belonging. And we get a lot of that with our students as well. Um, I've got the Brookline Educators for Educator Diversity uh, note there. That's the BEAD team. You've heard about the BEAD team since last year. Again, 20 amazing educators from across the district who are working tirelessly to hold events for educators of color and also events to recruit. And I'll talk about that in a little bit too. Um, we had our welcome back event for all of our educators of color at the Golden Temple in uh, early October, I believe it was. Um, we pretty much have an event every month or so. Um, we've got a lot of family events that are coming up. Um, the Office of Equity is working on um, a, a learning series, a PD series that we're calling sort of, it's all about the impact of white supremacy culture, which affects all of us. Um, and again, Heyoung and I are having the benefit to go around to all of our, our schools, doing two meetings, a piece at those schools to really talk about this. So there's that PD piece. 
Um, we also had, um, as many people know, our professional development day in November, um, where we had Debbie Irvin come to speak uh, to address, again, the idea of white supremacy culture. Um, again, some of this learning is super useful for our entire community. Uh, and obviously it means a great deal to educators and families of color. I mentioned the Massachusetts Partnership for Diversity and Education. We are a, a, a giant partner with the MP, MPDE. We're working on a winter conference um, that we are gonna make available to all of our staff members. Exit tickets is something that we are this, uh, working carefully with uh, the Office of, Office of Human Resources. Um, Ty Fluker and I've had a number of conversations about what it can look like to, you know, give exit tickets, not only uh, exit interviews, I should say, to all of our um, folks who are leaving the district, but also doing a little survey work, thinking about some survey work for our educators of color. The last piece here in terms of retention that I will mention, some people may know that um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education piloted a teacher diversification program last year. Um, we were a little late on this, um, so we did not, um, we were not a part of the program for 22 or for FY23, but we're working closely with MPDE and some of the folks over at DESE to make sure that we get our application in for FY24. Um, so the, some pieces for you for our retention efforts. In terms of recruiting and onboarding, here again, um, the BEAD events uh, we every other month like to have something for recruiting. Um, and so we're doing a lot of planning there. We've, um, and some of you have been to some of those events um, in the past, but what's sort of really informing our work this year is that we have uh, a portfolio compilation of, or a folder of resumes and other portfolios, it's 160 plus strong. Uh, in fact, there's so many that we were able to amass through our own efforts and through our partnership with MPDE. Um, and so we have a really robust sort of canon of resumes that we can vet and go through as we look And these, these resumes are all categorized, whether it's special education or pre-K or um, you know, uh, ele early elementary school, those kinds of things. Um, we're super excited about that database that we're able to work out of. In addition, we've got a spreadsheet of 300 contacts um, that we have made via a number of uh, job fairs, recruitment fairs. We don't have those, the resumes of those folks, but it gives us yet another sort of um, database to uh, to go through as we hold our events and as we make our communications and our contacts. We um, also have a, a DEI inclusive recruitment employee advancement toolkit that we got from Carney and Sando, which was a partner that we worked with uh, last year. Um, really, really great stuff that we are starting to use as we have conversations with hiring managers, um, especially as we move into uh, periods of, of when we move into our hiring season. Um, there's a little bit more here about the number of recruitment fairs and hiring fairs um, that we have sort of partnered with and will be uh, involving ourselves in even more vigorously uh, as 2023 comes upon us. Another slide that I'll just share with everybody is one that we retained from last year, just as a reminder that these are some of the pieces that we're thinking about, again, as the Office of Educational Equity partners with Human Resources uh, and the district at large, just thinking about our, the, the all-in concept. While there are 20 educators on our BEAD team, we work really hard to make sure that all of the educators in the district are speaking to their networks, speaking to their friends and family, um, and the community at large just putting the word out. Our care team does this work. That's the parent team. Um, Dr. Guillory mentioned uh, the seed for parents earlier. Again, this is part of the PD. It is helpful for educators of color to feel belonged and relationshiped in this district. Uh, and is as if they would like to stay. So I'm not gonna read all of these questions, but these questions are, to use Dr. Guillory's phrase, top of mind for us, as we think about our hiring practices, as we look at implicit bias in our hiring um, teams and questions and things like that. And then what does it look like to uh, really transition um, our, our uh, culturally diverse, our linguistically diverse, you name it, educators and their families into our district. Um, and so those are some questions that we continue to think about.
I think that's it for me. I'm gonna stop sharing screen um, and take some questions. All right, who has some questions? Suzanne? Yeah, thank you, David. Thank you, Janae, for this presentation. And, sure. you know, congratulations on the increase in uh, staff of color. Uh, I think that's moving in the right direction. We've talked previously, and I, I just wonder if it's gotten any traction offering a pathway for especially our paraprofessionals of color uh, mm -hmm. to become uh, teachers, classroom teachers. Is there anything to that? Can we, will that be helpful? Could we do that? Yeah, there's a there's so much work in a pipeline, Susanna. It's definitely something Dr. Guillory and I, Guillory and I have discussed and been thinking a lot about. We've uh, part of what's so great about the affinity groups that we're starting is that, and we even began this a little bit last year. That our our paraprofessionals of color are interested in being able to talk about you know what their experiences are. Some of them are in fact interested in becoming teachers or special educators, et cetera. Some of them are not, um, but some of them very much do want to. And so um, another um, really great thing that part, the, uh, the partnership with MPDE is that we're looking to stipend or support uh, mm -hmm. paraprofessionals who are ready to do a next level of education to get some certification toward that end. Uh, the pipeline piece, it's a long, it's a years long sort of process, right? It's not just something that you can get done in a year. Um, and so it's certainly something that we're thinking about. We don't have so much of our, the legs under us exactly just yet, but we're thinking about it. We're talking about it and trying to figure out the best entry point to get going with it. But certainly we're having those conversations with our paraprofessionals. Uh, and, you know, once upon a time, there was a program in Brookline, um, today's today today's students tomorrow's teachers I think it was called um, and so we're even talking to students and and trying to get some of our graduates and some of those those graduates come to our recruiting events and we work especially hard to you know get there get them um, to consider coming back to work in the system but it's something we're thinking about Suzanne it's just it's expensive and it's also uh, requires a lot of forethought, some of which we don't always have all the time for, but it's definitely on our minds. So thank you for the question. Yeah. We haven't let go of thank it. Thank you, Jeanette. Thanks. Mariah. Thank you, David. Thank you, Janae, for the presentation. Um, I, I just had a couple of questions. One, um, one was if afterwards you could send us just the, it, I didn't think I saw it, the comparator data to last year, just so that we could see, or even like multi-year sure. data to be able to see yeah. trends over time. And then I um, I heard you mention the increase in the number of black educators, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, could you comment about the number of Asian educators um, or AAPI educators as yeah. compared to last year? Because if it's my recollection and I could be wrong, that that is the educator population that is most disproportionate compared to our student. Am I remembering correctly compared to our Absolutely. student? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, that's exactly correct. So, and I can put the slide back up, but in 21, 22, the number, um, just the straight number of AAPI educators that we had, we were at 72.8. A number of those, um, a number of those individuals are paraprofessionals. Um, the same is true for a number of the educators um, who are African American Black. Um, and I, I know there a question had come to us about the breakdown of you know what those numbers actually represent. Are they Unit A? Are they Unit C? Are they non-aligned? Are they um, you know Unit B? Uh, I actually don't have that information. I think um, that Ty is the best person to answer that question. But the the slide deck that I just shared had us at. So we were 72 last year, 0. 0.8. Um, and then this year we were at 79 um, for our AAPI numbers. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right. Part of the focus for BEAD is to think about our AAPI staff in particular. Um, so yes. Okay. okay, thank you. And so is Ty then the best person to get the more detailed breakdown by the units as well? Because yes. that's another thing, right? Exactly. I'm glad you brought it up. It's so important too to think about the types of positions that we're seeing people in um, as well. Okay. Thank yes. you. You're welcome. Andy? 
Yeah, I actually had my hand up because I was the one who submitted that question earlier Thank about you, the, the further breakdown. I guess thinking about it more, um, maybe the for me the most useful categorization would be um, paraprofessionals, unit A without PTS and mm -hmm. unit A with PTS. Right. So if you could, yeah. and I'm pretty sure Ty is able to do this because I did yes. once request this um, for a presentation I was giving to the ARPA committee and she was able mm -hmm. to supply those numbers. So if you could, if, if it's possible to sort of have the breakdown that you showed, but for those three categories, paras, unit A pre-PTS, unit A with PTS. Definitely. I appreciate that. I can tell you for both for example, AAPI, Black Afro -American, African American, the numbers are strongest in muted A and in, in our paraprofessional um, groupings. Uh, in terms of PTS, I'm not sure. I would love to get those numbers. And Mariah, we will definitely put on a graph so that everyone can see what our numbers look like 2019, 2020, 2020, 2020 to 2021, and then now 22 to 23. And we have had an increase for sure. Thank you. It would be helpful to understand too, like um, absolute numbers and then and then percentages. Thank sure. you. Sure, yeah. And I, and, I, and I know Suzanne brought this up and obviously we've had an increase. Again, our focus as much as it is in the recruiting and the onboarding is the retention. And Dr. Guillory mentioned this very early on. If we're you know, at net zero, that's not helping anyone. Um, and so while we're recruiting and having um, educators of color join us, what does our work look like to retain them? And it's certainly been a focus for us. A question that I have going back to the first slide, do you have a breakdown of the numbers between our K-8 schools and 9-12, sort of dovetailing off of uh, public comment? Yeah, we do. And I know Desi, Desi has a breakdown sort of, of like, you know, sort of what percentage of your general staff works in what areas, whether it's K to two or three to six. Uh, and we're in-house, we're going to need to get those numbers because Desi doesn't provide those in terms of our staff of color, but we will definitely work on that and get you all the information. All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any more questions or comments? All right, seeing none, that brings us to a report on child study teams and multi-tiered systems of support. Excellent, thank you, David. Um, I am very excited um, to present this work. Um, this is work that we did in partnership with the New Teacher Center, and we actually have Mark Keeley and Renee Baker on the line, um, who were two of the principal investigators who really helped us um, to get the data, collect the data, and then they um, created this report of findings around our CST teams and RTI. So before we, um, I turn it over over to them. I did just want to take a moment to talk about the impetus for this work. Um, so as um, you all know, um, the district got cited for disproportionality um, by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, and one of the action steps um, required us to think about um, what are the actionable steps that we're going to take um, to mitigate this disproportionality? So right away, I started thinking about our CST teams. So CST teams are groups of teachers at the school, the school site that come together um, that talk about problems of practice related to um, uh, student performance. They look at individual students and think about what are the supports that um, they might need um, to bolster that students, whether it has to do with their social emotional development or their academic achievement. Um, and so these school-based teams um, give support to other educators in thinking about what are some next steps you can try what are some interventions you have in place? What, are the, what does the data say around how those interventions are or are not working? Um, and what are potential next steps? And while this is a general education um, uh, team, um, when a child is referred for an evaluation, um, that child really, the case should really be brought to CST um, first. Um, and so that makes them a very high leverage entity um, in this work. So we started off thinking about, well, what, what do we know about what's working about CSTs and then areas for growth? So that was one piece. And then in thinking about that, um, I started thinking about, um, 
our RTI or MTSS model or possibly lack thereof, because those things really go hand in hand. As our CST teams are thinking about student interventions and collecting data, that goes right along with having a strong RTI or MTSS process. Um, so we were really fortunate um, to get the new teacher center to engage in this work. And so Mark and Renee um, are gonna present their findings. And I think that this is a place where we can then um, take these findings and think about um, where do we want to put our resources going forward um, and what is some of the high leverage work um, that we want to engage in um, in support of our, our students. Um, so that being said, oh, and just one more thing. I also just want to give a shout out to our CST teams and CST leaders. Um, so our CST leaders were awesome in terms of supporting this review. Um, they booked times with the interventionists at the school. Um, they made sure that we had time or that the new teacher center had time with the school leaders. Um, uh, they got to observe in classrooms and that was all organized by the CST um, leaders. And that work, um, being on a CST team is a lot of work um, because you're not only participating on the CST team, there's always follow-up that happens after the, the meeting concludes. Um, so I just want to publicly thank our CST um, teams and especially our leaders. Um, and that being said, I will turn it over to Mark and Renee. Hey, how are you guys doing? We are great. Thank you so much for having us. Really appreciate the time today. So thank you for uh, inviting us to be part of this conversation. So uh, I'll quickly introduce myself and I'll turn it over to Renee to introduce herself as well. So my name is Mark Healy. Uh, I'm a senior director of New Teacher Center. I used to be the K-12 math coordinator in your neighboring uh, city of Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I uh, was the K-12 math coordinator there a couple moons ago. Um, currently live in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I've moved around being a school principal, district administrator, worked in charter schools and, and uh, public school districts. I'm super excited to be engaging in this work and to share our findings with you today. So I'll share, I'll turn over the floor over to Renee just to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Renee Baker. I am the Director of Program and Partnerships. And I have also um, many moons ago been a science teacher and district administrator for science and been a director of a charter school, administrator in schools. I've, I worked in Maryland and I currently live and work in Ogden, Utah. Thank you for having us. Awesome, great. So let's say I'm gonna share my screen if that works or do you wanna share? What, um, sure, right? we could do either way. What's easier for you, Mark? Uh, if you have the presentation up, do you wanna share that? that yep, makes it easy? I yeah, I can do that, no okay. problem. Okay, I'm gonna have it here too if you need me to. Okay, hold on a second. Just hit that slideshow button on the, yeah, perfect. Awesome, great, thanks, Leslie, great partnership. Uh, so really appreciate again the time today. So really our purpose of our time today uh, with you is to share some of the findings from our review. Um, again, I wanna just echo things that Leslie shared. Um, your CST leaders were incredible. Um, so open, so uh, supportive of this process, really wanting to learn and dive into conversation. So. Um, I will echo the sentiments there. Just really exciting to be part of this, this great community. So um, just in the next slide, we'll give you a little quick introduction to uh, who we are. <clears throat> so NTC is a new teacher center. We started off really supporting new teacher induction work back in the 90s, have really moved into our mission around supporting districts in disrupting the predictability of educational inequities for systemically underserved students. Uh, so as we think about uh, students are often uh, not being served by district policies or by school policies, we want to work to, to end those and to change them. So this felt like a really nice partnership to think about how there's a disproportionality uh, citing, and we want to make sure that we're helping you think about how we make sure every student is really seen and, and supported. So that's just a quick little introduction to who we are. So a little background of this study uh, is, if you want to take the next one. So a little background, as we think about going into this work, uh, we want to think about components of successful instruction. So just kind of big picture of what it is that we want to see in schools, and then we can give you some of our findings of how they relate to this, this vision. So we want to start off thinking about what's the visionary instruction in the district, right? What does that look like? Um, and that really gives a common language for teachers and students to think about when we think about instruction. From that visionary instructional framework in a district, we move to program guiding principles. So how do math departments, ELA departments, bilingual departments, 
um, special education departments create guiding principles that are related to that visionary instructional framework and give teachers and students and, and principals those, that language and lens that they need to think about by content area. And then lastly, schools are, are able then to make instructional goals because we're in a coherently aligned system around instruction. So you can kind of imagine a, an image with all the arrows pointing up, right? All working towards the same goal um, at different levels or different ways, but we're all working towards the same place. So kind of keeping in mind this big vision is what we're trying to think about when we think about all policies leading into one direction. So as we think about RTI, this response to intervention, we're thinking again about that movement that everything is connected. So specifically, the way that Massachusetts Department of Education, um, Department of Ed, uh, Elementary and Secondary Ed thinks about uh, the, the multi-tiered system of support, they think about RTI as one component of it, right? So the multi-tiered system of support, the MTSS, is really focused on all possible things. So social, emotional, behavior, right? And so we're really focused in this case around the academic interventions around RTI. So as you think about this image, we're really thinking about tier one, just kind of make sure we're all using the same language here. Tier one is the classroom instruction. That's the universal support that every student is getting. We differentiate for students within the classroom. We support them, but it's all happening within the, the, the classroom. Here too is when we offer a little bit more support. So we're thinking maybe about 15% of those students, 10 to 15% of those students who maybe didn't get um, the supports they needed within the tier one instructional um, environment. We support them in a tier two environment, which could be inside the classroom, could be outside the classroom, um, but it's a support for a, a smaller number of students. And then tier three is that intensive support, maybe about 5% of our students who really need that intensive support to get back into getting to that tier one instruction. So RTI, the goal of RTI, as you see here, um, is to really think about all the ways that we monitor student progress and support them. And then if we find that we've done everything within the tier one system, the tier two system, the tier three system, then we need to think about special education as a, as a possibility. So we wanna make sure that in, our, in a successful RTI model, that we are offering all supports possible to meet the needs of students to get back into tier one instruction. And in a CST model, a child study team, that a team is meeting to think about what are those interventions that that student needs to get back into tier one instruction. So that whole process needs to happen before we really refer anyone to special education. And so that was our process, is to think through how is that happening in Brookline and how are we making sure that we go through all those, those processes first before we refer, refer for special education. So as you, as you know, there is a disproportionality uh, citing, won't go through all of it here, but just the, the big headline, of course, is just that there's a disproportionate number of Black and African American students that were cited with a specific learning disability. Um, so you can see on the side here, some of the, the numbers, right? We're showing that uh, many of our students are being uh, categorized with an SLD, a specific learning disability. Um, and that as we think about those students, that 45% of those students are not receiving that general education intervention. So that's that tier one, tier two, tier three support. And our CST teams, if they're running properly, should be ensuring that those interventions are being given to students within a really clear documented pathway. So what we reviewed, uh, the first thing that we did was we thought about our site visits, right? We went into all Brookline schools, uh, in those, those visits, we supported interviews, as you can see the different stakeholders that we interviewed. We had focus groups of people together um, to learn from each other, think from each other, build off each other's thinking. Um, of course, in those site visits, we have classroom observations. So how are we seeing tier one, tier two, tier three being played out in the classroom? Uh, we met with intervention groups um, and saw uh, how students are actually meeting with an intervention. So there are interventionists at every school. And so how are students being supported by them? Uh, we attended CST meetings and saw what they look like. Um, we did a review of curriculum and intervention materials. Um, and lastly, really thought about the, the related documents. So the CST meeting agendas, um, the student reports for every CST meeting and what we're, we're expecting as goals for our students and how we're seeing that cycle happen. So just to kind of give you a sense of how deep we went into this work, we really tried to, uh, to look through every single possible way of, of seeing how this is being implemented in, within Brookline. So the way that we thought about um, how we're going to use this vision and make sure that we used a common vision across all of our work was using the RTI implementation rubric developed by the Colorado Department of Education, which has been endorsed by the RTI Action Network. Uh, this implementation rubric is thoughtful around how we think about this 
this blueprint of RTI implementation, right? What are the pieces that we need to think about? So within that rubric, there are six uh, categories that we look at. And within each of those six categories, there's four, uh, four growth stages. So uh, unless you want to hit the next one, I'll show you those growth stages. So uh, we look at emerging, we look at developing, we look at operationalizing and optimizing. So if you are emerging, you are very uh, in the beginning stages of growth. If you're in that optimizing, you're finding that the model's embedded and done with fidelity. So there's definitely a spectrum. So as we thought about the six categories that are within this rubric, we made some general uh, observations and some uh, ratings based on what this rubric tells us uh, is the implementation. So if you go to the next slide, you can see what we rated with Brookline. So under leadership, you'll see that, actually I'll say within the six categories, you'll see that uh, four of them are in the developing and the uh, two of them are in the operationalizing. So again, that developing is that second level, right? So just above the emerging um, and the oper operationalizing is the third level. So again, the fourth one is, that, is the highest. So in the middle for, for all of them. Um, we've developed a report that we've handed to Leslie. That report has uh, information around the six categories. Um, the anchor questions that you see in the middle are in that report as well. And then we have specific recommendation on, on, and observations we found for each of these six categories. So our point for today is to kind of give you the, the high level uh, information around what we saw in there, but there is a report that the district has um, that will go into more detail to these categories and why we came to these levels, if that's uh, something that you're further interested in. Uh, so let's go deeper into the, the, the actual observations and what we found. So first thing is we had school site visits. You see that we, again, interacted in many ways as we were in each of the schools. We spent about, uh, about two hours to a half day in each school uh, and supporting uh, some discussions, some classroom observations, and of course, reviewing all the documents and all the uh, instruction that's happening. And of course, uh, for firsthand, what's happening in each of the classrooms and in those uh, intervention groupings. We also engaged in focus groups. Um, so Leslie, next slide, I'll show you a little bit about focus groups here. So the focus groups, uh, again, included our content specialists, our teachers, our principals, our district leaders, um, and you can see some of the sample questions, right? Just as, as basic and foundational as what's the primary function of your child study teams to digging into how does the school engage students, and parents and guardians in the CST process, right? So we're thinking about all the levers that will make this a success. As we engaged, excuse me, in those focus groups, we found three things that felt like really common things that you'll see throughout our report, but wanted to call out the three things that felt were um, coming from your own staff that felt like a high level uh, three uh, actions to take. Um, so that's the next one there. So the themes here, first one, didn't feel like there was a district-wide vision for response and to instruct and to intervention and to child study team. So thinking that there is definitely a vision for it to happen, some people felt that there wasn't a vision of, so we've got it in place, we have these meetings, what do we do now? Um, there was a document uh, created in Brookline several years ago that did lay this out. Uh, what we did find is that there just wasn't fidelity to that or that every school had kind of morphed and taken on their own different, uh, different way of doing things. Um, second one, as we think about curriculum implementation and intervention schedules, they varied greatly. So it really mattered about which school a student went to if they got more intervention or less intervention. Um, so schools felt a little tied in terms of ways that they were able to support their students. Um, I will say with that, which will lead into the third one, uh, the third finding is that this was more of an issue for math than it was for ELA. Um, we found ELA and literacy had more commonality and more implementation than math did. So that leaves us to our third one, as many schools didn't feel like they had the adequate resources to support math intervention needs. So trying to build off the successes that's happening in literacy and ELA feels like a next step to, to support with math. So I wanna dig into um, the findings by, by each category. So we'll start with response to intervention. Um, what I wanna call out here is some strengths that we saw that felt really exciting because what we really wanna do in our report is share with you the things that are going well and how do you build from those. Um, and then we're going to share with you some, some areas that you can continue to grow. So as I shared, literacy support for intervention felt consistent across several schools. We felt that as districts, uh, district leads were meeting, the CST leads were meeting, uh, there was more commonality, more um, discussion, more um, clarity that was happening in literacy. It still feels like there's lots of room to grow, but that was, there were some exciting things happening on the literacy side. 
Um, as Leslie shared with us, and we've seen in practice, is that there's a dyslexia screener for grades K to two. Um, I've appreciated talking with Leslie about this, that feeling like the need to really support our students uh, from the get-go, from the very beginning in K-2 feels right, feels important. Um, and so this felt like a really nice move for the district to make to support um, uh, with a screener in grades K-2 grades K and support students in what they need right away. We found a district-wide district SEL screener um, and supporting students in additional SEL and behavioral supports. As we're uh, you know, living this new era around COVID, that obviously has made some, some major progress when we're supporting our students and thinking about the SEL needs that they really that really have. So that felt like a nice uh, connection because in, as I shared with the Massachusetts uh, multi-tiered system of support, that MTSS, SEL is part of that, right? Our behavioral interventions is part of that. So there's definitely um, some good places happening around there. Um, as we think about the allocation of school counselors, behavior specialists, and other staff, there's staff on, on school sites to support social emotional behavior needs, which felt really exciting. And lastly, uh, the district has many partnerships. Uh, lots of community agencies are supporting, as you can see the list there, and, and many more that we didn't get to include um, that are helping our students not just survive, but thrive. Uh, it felt really exciting to see um, the Brookline, really Brookline Park District trying to work with so many community agencies to meet the needs of their students in there. So next slide, talking about the, uh, the areas for continued growth. So as I shared, there didn't feel like there was a district-wide math intervention program. A lot of uh, meetings that we went into, classrooms we went into, were using things like Teachers Pay Teachers, grabbing things that were from other uh, curriculum resources. So again, when we think about uh, our goal around making sure those equitable practices happen in schools, it felt like students, you know, depending on what zip code they're in, what school they went to, it depended on whether they got math intervention or not. Um, and so that felt really important. Uh, math content specialists often didn't have the time built in their schedules to provide math intervention to students. Uh, we found that literacy was prioritized and math was not. So they didn't feel like there was an equity of space or a, um, a, a way to support the students based on what their needs were. And so schedules weren't being determined by students, they're being determined by just what they had availability before. Um, each school operates autonomously, um, right? And so there's that idea of, of local control and we want to think about how much control schools get. But again, when schools get a lot of autonomy, um, it means to varying levels of RTI implementation. So um, there's got to be some way to help support schools and knowing uh, how do they think about a strong RTI implementation. And a lot of leaders felt like they weren't getting that support necessarily uh, to think about what is the right uh, levers to push on to ensure we have strong RTI implementation. Um, you know, another exciting thing that is that every school has a math and literacy uh, specialist but we found how they provide that support and, and schedule intervention support, again, varies greatly, right? So whether it was built in the schedule or not, just the amount of support that they were able to give uh, was determined by the schedule. And, and that meant that they, uh, the amount of support they, they very, uh, that they gave varied greatly. Um, and lastly, each school supports the core curriculum in different ways. So I talked a little bit about that teachers pay teachers and other curriculum areas. Um, so there wasn't a clear content alignment or pacing across all campuses. And as we think about the most important part about this is if you remember that that uh, schoolhouse picture that I had, right, all of these pieces are getting us to that foundational tier one instruction, right? So if our tier two are not in alignment, right, those arrows pointing up and they're pointing in different directions, we're not getting back to the core, which is our tier one instruction. So um, our, instruct our interventions really need to align strongly to tier one so kids can get back into tier one instruction without any needs for intervention. So I'm going to switch gears and move into our CST findings. So CST, again, the child study teams. The purpose of child study teams, again, are to meet about students and make recommendations about the interventions that they need, to look at assessments and see what's the, the need that they have, and create a plan for that student. And that should really be a cyclical process. You know, uh, CST meetings should happen uh, frequently so that we know every six weeks, we know what progress a student has made, uh, and that in the next six weeks, we're going to move on to this next goal and slowly move on so that they get out of this uh, child study team process and move back into tier one instruction um, well. What we do find with many child study teams and in, in places outside of Brookline as well is sometimes they're not aligned. And so we move to the special education referral too fast. Um, so in terms of the current strengths here, we really were excited to see the district supporting collaborative problem solving approaches. Um, in our conversations with Leslie and watching some of the CST lead meetings, we we saw a lot of people connecting. We saw a lot of people working together, thinking about the collaborative problem uh, solving approaches, which seemed really exciting. 
And so more of that feels important to get to the coherence we want to get to. Um, each school has an existing child study team. Uh, so it's, it's known as a process. It's known as something that they should be doing. Um, district holds regular CST lead meetings, as I shared. So providing training, providing resources, opportunity for discussion. School leadership and staff provide classroom management resources, promoting appropriate behavior, right? So we often have students who are acting out often because they're disengaged or because they can't interact with the classroom material because it's too high a level for them. They don't have the right intervention to support them. And so there's behavior uh, challenges. So as we're implementing this, we're also thinking about the appropriate behavior supports that are needed. And schools offer tiered behavioral interventions, right? So the things that we found exciting um, was you have the screener for SEL, you have a ton of staff in your buildings that are supporting the SEL and behavioral needs. Your administration is working within these CST meetings to support behavior uh, and reducing inappropriate behavior. So I'd say, you know, on the MTS side of uh, social emotional behavior, Brookline's much stronger, which feels really exciting. So now that you have students who are engaged in the work and, and know how, how to uh, self-manage themselves in terms of their behavior and are ready to engage in content, we need to make sure that the academic interventions are also there too. So that leads us to our areas of continued growth. So child study teams uh, follow established agendas and problem solving protocols to refer to students, but they're not consistently implemented across schools. So we found that if one student uh, was put up for a child study team and was engaged in that, uh, that child study team process, some schools would just go through the process as a way of saying, okay, great, this student's gonna go be referred for student special education without actually implementing any of the interventions. And some did it in cycles, right? So again, it just wasn't consistent. So again, it's not fair for a student to get the right support depending on which school they go to. Um, schools utilize ver various data collection tools and analysis processes. We found that the most truthful for math, right? As we shared, there's not a lot of support for the math program and the intervention um, process there. Um, so that feels like a really strong area for continued growth um, to think about how we are, are being coherent in our data collection tools and analysis processes with some um, strong focus on math at the beginning. Um, it's also a mandate to include parents and students in this, in this work, right? We want them to be engaged. We want them to be participating. We want students to know why they're being pulled out by an interventionist or why they're working with an interventionist at the back of the room or why an interventionist is supporting them at their desk. Right? We also want parents to know about this process so that a special education referral doesn't come as a surprise, but they can also support at home and be part of this cyclical CST process. And we found that there's varying degrees of that. Some schools did not include them at all. Some did include them. Uh, and so that felt like a really uh, a, a great area for growth to include our, our families in this work. Um, SEL behavior tool intervention implementation, again, varied across schools. Um, you know, we have staff who are doing this work, we have the, the programs in place, but there still was some, some variance. Um, and the allocation of those counselors, BCBAs and social adjustment counselors varied by school as well too. So again, the, the thing that's really feeling exciting about the CST process here is that there's foundation there. We have a system that we, uh, that we can be using. We have a protocol, we have leads meeting together. It's now on the district to think about how do we ensure that all nine schools are doing it consistently and supporting each other with, the, with that consistent, consistency and, and coherence. Um, so moving on to from this, we've given you a lot, right? There's a lot of things that are in here. So I want to just call out, what are some high level recommendations as your first next steps? Um, I'm very aware when we give people a bunch of recommendations becomes uh, a lot. So we've given you a report that lists everything in one table. So by the six categories that are in the RTI um, uh, framework, we've called out some short-term priorities you just should think about and some longer-term priorities. Uh, and so this is in the report. We won't call this out because this is lots to read, but we'll um, happily share that within the report. What I do wanna share with you though, is where do we go next now, right? What's the first step we need to be making? And so we've called out four priorities that feel like some really great next steps that are from these priorities. So um, in the next slide, you'll see uh, the four priorities called out. So first one is reviewing these findings reports. I think it would be really um, powerful to be reviewing these reports within uh, principal meetings, within your cabinet, superintendent's cabinet, within uh, teacher meetings, right? Getting that, that information out to schools to know that this is something the district is, is engaged in, is thinking about, and wants to work towards. And to do that, we need to provide some initial PD for our district and school leaders uh, to develop common goals and priorities, right? Our leaders set the stage for this work to happen and set the structures. So just knowing that coherence is the place we want to get to 
um, we need our district and school leaders to come together to create that coherence. So that's our first initial um, priority that we feel like is, is, a, is the next step. Next one is to review your core curriculum implementation, your tier one instructional practices. So what's happening in the classroom? And if we go from uh, one classroom in one school to another classroom in a school down the street or even across the city, are we seeing the same thing? Or are we seeing vastly different things? Um, and that again, that's for that tier one, because if we're intervening for st with students, our goal is to make sure that they can access tier one instruction. And if they can't, uh, that's when intervention happens, right? But if we're giving them intervention that's not aligned with the tier one or the tier one is not aligned across the schools, then our intervention practices, uh, practices are not moving in that same upward direction. Uh, next, reviewing current academic and behavioral assessments and screeners. So really exciting again, as I shared, that there is a dyslexia screener for K-2. Thinking about how do we make sure we screen all students uh, and know and use that information to help support our CST teams in, in making some good decisions. And lastly, it feels so important to include our families in this work. So developing a uniform policy on parent and guardian communication and participation in the CST process um, with more collaboration at home, Parents are able to support their, their child at home with some of the goals that the CST team is working on as well, um, which allows for a much more coordinated support um, effort um, to, to work with our, our children and get them back into that tier one instruction. So with that, uh, I want to turn it over to anyone with questions um, and just any discussion that you want to engage in. And Leslie, feel free to add on anything that I may have missed um, in my discussion. Well done, Mark and Renee. Um, I, I'm really impressed with the work that the new teacher center did. I think they nailed it in terms of really getting to know um, the work in our district and this work specifically. Um, I'm really happy to report that we're already working on one of the first priorities. Um, we've already scheduled for the new teacher center to come back on January 11th, and they're going to walk through the report with our school leaders um, and district uh, special education um, uh, uh, administrators. And maybe even now that I'm thinking about it, we should get um, the OTL folks there as well. Um, so they'll walk through this report and the findings, and then they'll start to preview and engage in some of the high leverage PD work at that session too. So um, we're already off and running on uh, thinking about how to address some of the priorities that were named. Um, that being said, happy to take any um, questions that the committee has. Who would like to go first? Suzanne? Uh, thanks, David. I'm just wondering, um, just so we're clear on the terms, we talked about specialists, but I believe in addition to specialists, we have interventionists. Um, so yep. I, didn't, I didn't hear that. And so I'm wondering uh, where they fit in or if we just lumped them together or we, we have different ro roles, I believe, for specialists and interventionists. Is that not true? I'm confused. So, well, we call our interventionists specialists. So the specialists, we have math specialists and literacy specialists, and both of those um, constituents, they um, deliver intervention uh, support to students. Okay. So in addition, though, then we have coaches. Is that who work with teachers? And then we teachers? also have coaches. Right. So one of the things that's a little tricky is that in literacy, we have literacy coaches and literacy specialists, and the jobs are very distinct. In math, we have math specialists that do coaching and deliver intervention. So there's a little bit of a difference there. And this work um, has gone back even from when I started in the district in 2017 and thinking about that math specialist role um, and what is the highest leverage work that they should do? Is it the tier one coaching? Is it the intervention work? And we're still working to find that happy medium and that sweet spot um, around um, you know, what they deliver and how often they deliver it. And I think that that really contributes to some of the findings that the new teacher center found specifically around math. That makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you. So uh, just another clarification. I often think of tier three as uh, working with students who have IEPs. So I, th I think we have a slightly different definition. So you said that tier three were students who received like pull out or, I mean, I'm confused, but you got, I got tier one. I understand tier two. I'm a little confused on tier three. Yeah. 
Uh, Leslie, I'm happy to answer that if, unless you want to. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So really special education happens throughout all three tiers, right? So special education students are in the tier one, they're in two, 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 three. Um, we think about IEP goals and we think about where they're met within tier one or tier two or tier three. It is definitely a, a misconception that many uh, have held and some research has called on the past that tier three is only special education. You will still look at some models and see some models calling out tier three is only special education. Our belief is that we're always working towards supporting tier one instruction. Um, and when a student is in a special education, they are outside either in tier three, tier two, tier one, wherever those goals that need to be or accommodations and modifications need to be made. They might be made in a tier three setting. They might be made in a tier two setting. They might be made in a tier one setting. So what we value more is the flexibility and not um, labeling students only to the lowest or the or highest, whichever we want to say it, um, level of instruction, but instead support them at where, which environment they should be at in their, their need. And if you think about it, Suzanne, um, in tier three, that should only be about 5% of a population. And right. when you think about students receiving intervention support from a specialist, that's about what we're looking at. That's about what we're appropriately staffed to do as well. Our interventionists aren't doing tier two. I, I'm pretty sure they are, aren't they? So at times they're doing tier two, but also a lot of times tier two happens in the classroom with the, the general education teacher. So right. for instance, right. um, and I've seen it many times, um, if you have a young person that let's say they're struggling with literacy, right? And they're getting this literacy support in tier one um, and they're making some progress, but we think they can make more. They might get a double dose of that from their classroom teacher. So let's say um, they're doing small reading groups um, where most children maybe will get, be in a small reading group I don't know, let's say once a day um, in tier two, we have some kiddos who might get it twice a day or you know, more than what um, is happening in tier one. Okay, and I just had uh, one other different comment and then I'm so glad you brought up the parents. Um, we've been having discussions in town. There've been groups having forums around um, uh, literacy challenges for some of our students and, and parents have felt that at times they have not been included uh, and, and they had no idea the children were struggling so much in reading and it would come up much later. So I'm assuming that you think parents should be involved even early on, even in the first child study team meeting. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. yeah, yeah, we definitely find just obviously a partnership between home and school and every aspect is always important, right? So um, in these child study teams, especially when their child is struggling, that's the most important time to get our students, right, our, our parents involved. Um, so we make the recommendation that all families should be involved from the start. Well, and some parents, you know, also know their child well as a learner. Yeah. Um, they're, not, they're not professionals, but they know them as a learner and they have important information to share. That's right. Uh, about what they've learned about their child as a reader or a mathematician or whatever it might be. That's right. Yeah, and, and our recommendation is also for students to be involved for the exact same reason, right? Yeah, the reason I'm struggling is because you use this text all the time and it doesn't refer to me. I don't see my identity in that, right? So um, having students also be part of that feels really important as well, too. Thank yeah, you. Thanks for that. Jennifer? Uh, thank you. This is this is great. This is a lot of um, information, and um, I look forward to reading more about the specific findings. And um, I appreciated that you pulled out some sort of like four priorities for now, the now. Um, and I'm just wondering, and and maybe um, this is a question for for district folks. Um, I I heard mention of the January 11th meeting, so. Um, it sounds like that's where the sort of the report from the information would be shared and then plans for PD will come forward from that January 11th meeting. And I'm just thinking in lieu of prior conversations we've had this evening, sort of where this body of work will rest um, as it can it continues so that we can follow up on these um, RTI and CST sort of action plan. Um, what does that look like on the district side after January 11th? 
Yep. So I think it needs to continue to rest um, in, in dual offices. And that would be um, with Lisa in OSS and with OTL. And so actually we have a call with um, the new teacher center tomorrow um, to talk about next steps in terms of, um, you know, my transition. Um, Lisa and I have had conversations. Um, she's prepared um, to, to really take more of a leadership role in this work. And then Michelle Herman will also support the work as well. So that will ensure that it stays um, in, in both houses, um, uh, uh, general education and special education, um, because there's so much of this that um, that is both. And so I don't think it can just sit in one department. I think it really needs to be a collaboration. Thank you. That's really helpful. And, and I do really appreciate the, the focus on a really strong foundation in tier one instruction. Um, uh, as the, the, the way that we can sort of evaluate what our RTI, our tier two models, our tier two, three models are, and, and really aligning the, um, the assessments and screeners and the protocols so that there's consistency, not only consistency in tier one instruction and, the, and consistency in sort of the protocols and procedures for decision making, family involvement. So I think this sounds like it makes a lot of sense to me. So this is good. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And you know, one of the things I just want to shout out is that, um, and Mark really referred to this, is that we should be really proud. We have a lot of the resources and the, the puzzle pieces, right? So, you know, you go to put a puzzle together and then you can't find a piece and you're like, oh shoot, I can't put this thing together, I'm done. Um, we've got all the pieces, we know where they are. We just need to put them together and make them fit properly. Um, so, you know, I think that that's, um, that's actually really good news. And it just is uh, how we think about making things coherent, how we communicate this work to families and to educators. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot of work to do um, there's also a lot to celebrate too. Andy? Uh, yeah, this is maybe a follow-up for Leslie on, on Jennifer's question. So I, I do have the impression that sort of any anything that involves trying to standardize practice across the district, and in particular anything that requires district-wide PD is a very, very heavy lift. Um, so I'm wondering, do does PSD right now, in your view, have the capacity to undertake uh, to you know to follow up on these priorities because there, there's always so much competing for the very limited PD time available, right? So how how high is this rise? Yeah, I really appreciate that question, Andy. So we could always use more PD time, <laughs> and this is a challenge not just for us. This is a challenge everywhere. Um, and thinking about you know we we don't educators already have a lot on their plate, and we don't want to overburden them. But there's also work we need to do in service of students, and so we need to think about that. You know, I think it's really just going to take thinking about how we use the time and resources that we have. How do we use you know, um, how do we use, is there a way to leverage faculty meetings for some of this? Um, we have some resources, um, some funding resources, need to think about compensating people for their time for professional development that is a must for us. Um, so I think there's some ways to go about it. It, it is gonna get tricky, Andy, because there's a lot of competing priorities, um, uh, but, I think if we, we think creatively about it and we really use a cross-functional approach across departments, we can get it done and doing this work in collaboration with school leaders. So we need to think about district time. We need to think about school-based time and think about how we leverage all of that um, um, to get the work done. So it's, it is gonna be tricky. It's gonna be tight. Um, but, and some of this is the work that we're doing anyway, right? So especially around tier one, um, and my thought, and we've already started doing this, um, talking to coordinators about the professional development that they offer, when they offer it, again, making it, I hate to keep using the same word, but just making that more coherent. Um, there's some of this work that spans across content areas. And so, um, you know, how do we, how do we make this as easy for our educators to access as possible? I'm wondering if you could talk a little more about goal setting on child study teams and monitoring progress and who's responsible for monitoring progress, whether that's a collaborative effort between the classroom teacher and the members of the child study team, if there's some kind of handoff that takes place. 
Yeah, that's an excellent question, David. So that is a collaborative approach between the classroom teacher and the child study team. And so I think that's a practice we want to make sure is in place with every child study team is that the child study team is supporting the classroom teacher with both collecting the data, um, reviewing the data, and then thinking about next steps. So it really is a process that goes hand in hand. And I see the child study team um, as a body that supports the, the general education teacher or, or which, whomever is a teacher that brought the child to the team, the team should be supporting them with documenting that data and thinking about various data sources. And sometimes um, the child study team will do some of the assessments, right? So I've definitely seen even at Pierce um, where we have, um, a, a, we had an, an OT um, that would occasionally come and visit child study teams and then we would say, oh, this child, we think there's a need. And the OT will say, well, let me do an assessment and then I'll bring that information back. Um, so it's it's a real collaborative approach, but we wanna make sure that our CST teams feel comfortable supporting teachers in that process of how to document the data, how to look at the assessments. And quite frankly, um, M class has put us in a really good position to progress monitor um, how students are doing. We can look at how they're doing every six to eight weeks. Um, the data is, is very easy to read. We don't have a lot of progress monitoring tools. So if you think about like when we presented on M class and the type of data you saw, we can get about a child and their growth, or if they're not making growth or progress, we don't have that same type of progress monitoring for grades three through eight. Now, I think that DESE very shortly is going to mandate that third grade um, participate in the dyslexia screener. So we, we, you know, Dr. Guillory and I have already talked about this. It's in our budget asks around expanding um, to uh, M class to third grade. Um, I think we need to talk about what that looks like for grades four through eight as well, um, because we don't have that same type of progress monitoring tool that is you know, criteria referenced, it's normed. Um, we really need that. Thank you, Suzanne. Yeah, thanks, David. I just, I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud, and I'm, we're not going to solve all this, of course, now. But I'm just wondering if we should be more explicit about the role of child study teams as we address the issues of disproportionality. I, I, I'm not hearing or seeing that bridge, and I'm wondering if we need to be more explicit. I mean, I will tell you, there was a time, Leslie, in Boston, where you could not go to. Uh, uh, and, uh, initial uh, IEP meeting if you had not been at a child study team for six weeks. That's so right. that was a real link in some ways. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, people, we would have the child study teams and meetings and we would come up with a plan and reconvene in six weeks and everybody would just say, it didn't work. You know what I'm saying? So then they went, it just delayed the whole IEP process by six to eight weeks. It didn't really you know, serve as a bridge to help us really figure out who needs what kind of interventions and what would make sense. So it seems mm -hmm. like in the conversations that we have, we should be as explicit as we can about why we are doing this and how this will address that issue of disproportionality. Yes, absolutely. CST teams are, are a real um, bridge um, or a real mitigating factor um, for, for disproportionality. So um, a child should not be evaluated unless they've been through CST, unless it, the evaluation was requested by a parent. Hands down, that's it. And there are times where that's not the case. And children are skipping, they're bypassing the CST process and, and somehow moving forward towards an evaluation. But this is something that Lisa and I have talked about. And I love Lisa's approach. I mean, she's just no nonsense with it. She's like, we're going to talk to ETFs. We, we need to, to be really clear that if a child hasn't gone through CST, um, unless the evaluation was initiated um, by a parent or guardian, that they need to be redirected to CST. And we need to see what interventions are working for, for our youngsters. Um, you know, the other thing I think that we need to think about, I just totally lost my train of thought as I said that. Oh, I know. Um, is Right now, there's a disconnect between 
how we decide which children get intervention and CST. So there's another body sometimes that will decide whether a child gets literacy or math intervention. So then when you bring the child to CST, you can, the CST team can go through the data. They can look at the data, they can dissect the data, they can do the progress monitoring, but there's not a lot of weight the CST team has to say, let me give you this additional intervention. They're kind of out of the loop in terms of recommending the child for an additional intervention. And we need to get CST in that loop so that they have other you know, interventions at their disposal that they can recommend for a student when they come through CST, if that makes sense. Am I making sense? Okay. Jennifer? And just to add on to what Leslie was just talking to, I, one of the things that I think is another concern is students who may need both literacy and math interventions and, and how we meet those needs within the parameters of our, of our school time. Um, and, and what does that look like? Do, you know, are we, do we do try interventions for six to eight weeks in one area and then in another? Are we, you know, look, we're looking for progress um, within these sort of formats or small group interventions, but it's, I think it's a, a universal problem for, for many districts. I think this is a Brookline specific issue, but I, sus I suspect that there may be um, that, that conflict of, you know, like when a student needs both, how do we meet those needs if we, in our planning purposes and scheduling? Yeah, you, you got it, Jen. That, that, is, that is an issue for us because what we don't want to do, <clears throat> excuse me, is if a child needs literacy intervention, we don't want to pull them from literacy <laughs> because then we're negating the additional dose that the intervention is, is, is you know, in place for. And, um, you know, there, there are tough choices that schools are making around children potentially missing world language or missing other things during the school day. And those are really hard choices. And so um, that was a part of uh, the impetus behind the wind block. Um, but then we also know which, you know, all this stuff is so related. It's, it's really interesting. You'll hear more about this when um, you hear the findings from the middle school review um, that the wind block is very difficult to implement in a K to eight schedule. It's incredibly difficult. So we got to resolve some of these things. But again, um, I think the, the, the great thing is that we have interventionists and we have a good number of interventionists that should be able to service the number of students um, that need that amount of intervention. So, and that's, you know, not, not all districts have that. So that, that's huge. Jennifer, do you have something further? Okay. <clears throat> Anyone else? All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Leslie and Mark and uh, Renee and everyone else who helped put this together. It was quite informative and you heard a lot of feedback from school committee members. This is an area that generates a lot of interest. So thank you very much for putting together this extensive presentation and we'll be communicating further, I'm sure. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Thanks so much for your time you. today. We appreciate you. Take care. Next up, we have an update on the 2022-23 district superintendent goals and priorities and an update on the strategic planning process. Dr. Guillory. Thank you and good evening again. Um, I wanna just walk through the goals that I'd shared with you uh, with the committee earlier in the summer, and I think we uh, talked a little bit about these in September as well. So this is a mid-year check-in on the goals and the year-to-date progress, and then an update on the strategic planning progress with the updated schedule. So my goal one, again, is around supervision and evaluation. My role as superintendent, it's very important that I am in schools and visiting schools seeing the work firsthand, seeing the work that our students are doing and what our, our how our teachers are challenging, how our educators are challenging our students and giving them rich and rewarding experiences. Um, the best part of my job is, is doing that and engaging um, with students at that level. Um, and part of that though, is through the supervision and the direct um, evaluation of the building leaders. 
And so I take my approach is uh, more of not as much about the written evaluation, although that is a necessary part of it, but it's the real time feedback uh, in the moment, uh, the conversations that we have there. And I'm very pleased to say that I share with you that we've built a pretty um, dedicated and robust visitation schedule uh, with the buildings. And you see a snapshot of what that looks like here. Um, and this does not include the additional superintendent day visits that were also uh, part of what was added uh, this school year. So ongoing supervision and evaluation, meaning that I'm checking in with principals about the goals that they're working on, what are the instructional areas that they are uh, looking to lead uh, with their schools uh, this year, as well as other aspects of the uh, both the professional practice and the student performance goal that they are working on. When we think about goal two, goal two is uh, all about the strategic planning process. And so the committee well knows this as well as our district leaders that this summer we launched the strategic planning process and unfortunately we had to put a pause on it. And that pause um, uh, scared us quite tremendously because we didn't know uh, where, how we were gonna move this needle further down the road without our designated consultant. Well, we picked up Dr. Ruth Gilbert Whitner who's gonna come in in the spring and pick us back up. Uh, and so what you see here on the right side of the screen is um, we're looking at a, uh, going to be looking at a three-year strategic plan for Brookline. Um, and again, it engages all the components that we had with uh, Dr. Likas, uh, where we will have a, a planning team that will be comprised about 35 or so individuals. Uh, in, uh, including students, parents, school committee members, teachers, administrators, mem members of the uh, leadership team, as well as community members. And we have a schedule that's pretty uh, laid out in the spring here that's pretty intense. Now, keeping in mind that we have multiple things that are happening in the spring, which our big one being our budget uh, process, but all of these components will fit together so that uh, we will have a strategic plan by the time we come out of this. So we're looking to launch uh, the strategic planning process uh, in terms of the meetings and building uh, the fibers together starting in March and hopefully uh, have the, the, a nice structure in place uh, by the end of May. So Dr. Gilbert is going to push us hard to get us there, but the work that we've already begun with Dr. Likas will be able to help us uh, continue moving forward. So goal two is all about the strategic planning process. So we're still on track with that. Goal three is fiscal stewardship. And there's been quite a bit of, um, when I was going through the hiring process, um, the concerns around fiscal stewardship and budget uh, were ever present. And that continues to be a goal of mine to make sure that we have the district in a solid financial status and that's working collaboratively, co collaboratively with our town partners uh, in this, making sure that we have a budget that meets our educational needs um, and that we're delivering on those educational needs. And so part of that structural change that we've seen this year um, is a cleaner uh, end of year report and cleaner um, quarterly reports. And so our next one should be coming up I think in the uh, January, February timeframe. And our goal is to make sure that we're being transparent with all aspects of our budgeting process, recognizing that we are not firing on all cylinders right now um, in our administration and finance office, but we do have a dedicated team of folks that are supporting us and will continue supporting us through this process. Um, goal four is the new superintendent induction program. Um, which again, you all have met uh, and engaged with Dr. King, who's my mentor in the program, retired superintendent out of the Wellesley Public Schools and spent 28 years as a superintendent here in Massachusetts. Uh, but again, the goal of the, uh, the, the superintendent program is to make a new superintendents or help them become stronger instructional leaders. And so again, my goal one ties directly to this goal four, uh, in that we're visiting classrooms uh, and discussing instruction on each of those visits 
uh, that's that's one of the, again, the proud moments that I have is being in the classroom with the students and, says, and asking principals their interpretation of what they're seeing as such. Again, we're not, I'm not in the spot where I'm providing uh, observation or feedback to the teachers because that's not my role. My role is to discuss the principal's process and what they're thinking about what they're seeing instruct it and about instruction across their, their campuses. Um, the new superintendent program um, has sites where uh, has uh, sessions where we come together as a new cohort, a group um, twice a month. And then I also meet with my mentor twice a month. So that's part of this particular program. And my fifth and final goal is um, looking again at departmental reorganization. I'm looking closely at the administration and finance office, as well as the uh, office of strategy and performance to see what types of efficiencies can be gained there. And so I've talked with both teams um, that we're looking at the structure because there are vacancies uh, in those departments or were in those departments that have allowed us or allowing me to look at those more strategically to see how can we get greater alignment uh, out of those particular offices. And so with that, I will open it up for any questions that you all may have about where we presently stand with the goals and the progress year to date. Suzanne? Yeah, I don't really have a question, Dr. Guillory. I just want to say thank you for giving us an update mid-year. I mean, one thing I would not want to happen is that we get to the end of the year when we're doing your evaluation, we go, oh, what about? So uh, it sounds to me like you were on, uh, on schedule for your goals and achieving those, but I want to give you a thank you for um, updating us and keeping us informed. And if for some reason it, something happens and you get off course, again, an update would help us so that you know, we, we know how to support you the best we can to meet your goals. So thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And, and with that, you just reminded me, um, I think it's important to recognize that I have these goals that I'm focusing on and we focus on them as a senior team, their goals then nest into that. And I think you, you've you certainly seen the work that Leslie's done tonight. You've seen the work that Janae's doing tonight. So all of those things are nested together so that it's not just the superintendent uh, leading the charge here, but we have a, a unified front uh, as we're engaging in the work. And so as different members transition out, and Leslie, the door's still open for you. <laughs> uh, but as we have different uh, members transition out, we, we still engage in that work and moving that work uh, forward on behalf of our students. And so again, students and staff are our priority one, and we want to make sure that we are engaging in work that uplifts them. Anyone else? Questions, comments? All right, seeing none, that brings us to subcommittee and liaison reports. Uh, Jennifer, how about curriculum? Uh, so I don't have a current report other than to say that we will be meeting next Tuesday from four to six. Uh, it will be a remote meeting um, and the docket of the agenda has been posted. Um, one of the topics that we'll be covering is um, um, talking about our athletics um, as part of OTL. So um, we're just having a discussion about that. Uh, so next Tuesday from four to six, we'll be meeting. All right. Valerie, do you have an update on diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice? Um, I do, and also on the Driscoll Building Project. So DIJ met, and um, we didn't get far with our student section of our equity policy. Our staff section is pretty far along, uh, but we did get a lot of good feedback and discussion going. And so I'm going to be working on a draft for us to reflect on at our next meeting um, with Janae. I'll send that around as soon as it's ready. And then in terms of, of the building project, um, as has been noted, I believe at prior meetings, we are a little bit delayed and the, the project team notified us a couple of days ago that September 18th is now the date. Um, but I did want to clarify a misconception out there that Indigenous Peoples Weekend is, is somehow the move-in weekend. That is not um, necessarily the case. We're hoping to get into the building in September and to have... Um, students in the new Driscoll School within a couple of days of, um, of that completion. So 
I just want to make sure that people were aware of that, that there was, it was not October um, as a foregone conclusion that we're really working to make sure that students are in the building um, by about mid-September. Andy? Okay, I ask, uh, will the beep classrooms be ready earlier than the rest of the building or anything like that? Because those classrooms won't have a home uh, in, in the beginning of September, right? Yeah, so um, I, I have to connect with Matt around this. We talked, we don't think so. We don't think they're going to be ready earlier. And um, we don't think that they will get um, the certificate of occupancy any earlier than the other classrooms. All right, thank you for that update, Valerie. Uh, as for policy, policy met jointly with DEIJ. So Valerie already covered what took place at that meeting. And that brings us to government. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Andy. Um, well, Mariah's not here for a finance update, but uh, in her absence, I have been signing the accounts payable warrants. Um, I did that on December 2nd and December 9th, uh, totaling, hold on, $714,838.82. So those are our non-personnel expenses for the last three weeks. All right, thank you. And that brings us to Suzanne, government relations. Yes, hi. We're trying to um, pull together the priorities we want to talk about at our a meeting with our legislators in January. Uh, I've had uh, Mariah and Helen have had a chance to give me some input. Uh, Dr. Guillory has given me some input. And so I believe you have a draft of uh, where we are right now. I don't know if you've had a chance to read it. I don't know, David, if we have to vote on these or if we can... Um, just have a conversation or people can get back to me about their concerns or their questions. Uh, I don't know how you want to do this. I don't believe we've usually voted on these. I think we've had it as more of a free flowing conversation with our yeah. legislative delegation. Uh, so I so, think more open it up for conversation if there are any questions or comments regarding the draft that was circulated. Yeah, so I took I took some of these from uh, last year, just brought them forward. I also got some, um, I contacted Glenn Kucher at the MASC and he sent me their list of legislative priorities. And then Dr. Guillory gave me a list of some of the um, uh, priorities from the MASC, uh, MASS, sorry, um, the uh, superintendent's group. And so that's what I've plugged in here. So. Uh, Dr. Guillory, I did put in, uh, uh, where is that, Robin? Oh, uh, the special education private schools tuition increase that with a 14% uh, possible rate increase. So that's number four, we did put that in. And there was something else you asked for. Uh, we put that, we put that in as well. Oh, we put in about COVID costs, uh, additional uh, concerns about, that was number nine, offsetting COVID-related expenses. So we did add that. Uh, Helen wanted something about um, Medco. I can add it. I have number 12, uh, mentions increased support for Medco. I can put in uh, stronger wording in its own uh, uh, notation if we want, if we want to make that a separate item. Otherwise, it's kind of covered there. All right. Uh, Nancy? Just wanted to bring up that the um, we had a parent um, leader meeting today, the communications team. Mariah and I, uh, Mariah and I met with, um, or, or during that meeting, the Brookline Innovation Fund gave a great presentation as to what they do and how they like to outreach into the community. We had some suggestions. Um, and I also um, have been having conversations with, um, uh, oh gosh, the acronym just, it just left me. Um, um, our, for our, with our, uh, Brookline, is it Brookline Can? Um, the, our, our, um, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and um, they had a very, very, um, they wanted to bring up a concern that there is no way for them to get regular updates from the school committee. And I'm wondering if that's something that we can talk about. 
whether offline or separately or because I didn't have an answer for them and I would like to be able to answer them. I, I agree that communication is important with all community stakeholders. So to the extent that they would like to be included in regular email blasts that go out, we can explore yeah. mechanisms for making that happen. Um, I think that um, this is a particularly vulnerable um, population given that a lot of them are not online at all. So that was something I just told them that I would bring up. All right, perhaps then some printed communications as well or mm. making them available, printouts. Yeah, we can talk about it. All right. So David, just to go back. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I oh, just sorry. Wanted... Were you not done? I'm sorry. Well, Suzanne. no, I just didn't know if everybody said we're okay with these priorities. If they're going to send me things offline, that's fine. I think, Robin, you want to send this out uh, before the holidays, correct? That's right. Because we want to, so that, so this, you know, it's not a legal document. It's just to give them uh, a list of priorities so they know what our talking points are and they can come prepared to talk about some of them so that, so we can add things or, or whatever. Yeah, Jennifer, did you want to talk about this? Yes. I, well, actually, what I wanted to say is that I read it before the meeting, and I don't have any further feedback, but I did review it, so you know that that, that is my feedback. It looks looks good to me. I didn't have any comments in particular. Like, I, did, I didn't have anything I thought we should add. I thought it was pretty comprehensive and focused really on, you know, the, um, the level and maybe increased funding wish that we have for Chapter 70 and, and a number of other things. So um, I thought it was in good shape. A lot of things were covered. Valerie? Um, so I read it to Suzanne. My only comment is that maybe when we talk about the fair share amendment that we clarify that we want to make sure that it's not displacing other educational funds. Right. That's a good point, Val. Yep, absolutely. All right. Dr. Gillery? Do we want to also add something about a MASBO fund? I'm, I'm sorry, MSBA funding as well? Yeah, do you have particulars? MASC had something about that, but I didn't know if you had something. I'll I'll double check it and circle back to you, but I was just wondering if that's, because that's also coming up, uh, and the commissioner mentioned it again today uh, on his call about how some communities are experiencing increases because of the MSBA is not funding at the levels initially. Especially with inflation, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, let me look for that on the uh, MASC. I'm not seeing it right off the top of my head, but it is here somewhere. And then we can we can circle back on that. Jennifer? Um, just actually Val's comment uh, made me think of the one thing that did come to mind when I was reading it. I don't think we specifically mention um, the fair share amendment by name anywhere in it. And I just, I want, um, I, I was thinking that whether it's in person or in the document that we you know, just continue to advocate that those funds get allocated to education and transportation as intended. Yeah, it's it's number six. Oh, so it is, it does, it is in there. I'm it sorry. says fair share I'm amendment. Listening. Yeah. Okay, perfect, thank you. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. All right, any additional liaison updates? All right, is there any new business? Seeing none, I am going to move that we meet in executive session pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A for the following purposes. Purpose three, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the Brookline Educators Union, Unit A grievance. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining and the litigating position of the public body, then the chair so declares. Purpose three, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the BEU, paraprofessionals. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares. And purpose seven, to review and approve executive session minutes from the following meeting, December 8th, 2022. Is there a second? Thank I'll you, second. Andy. Your vote, Suzanne? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Andy? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Valerie? Yes. And I also vote yes. We will not be returning into open session. So for those of you who are watching in the public, have a good night, happy holidays. And uh, the rest of us are going to continue on a separate link. Good night.